David Hackett Fisher, how do you feel when reviewers or readers say to you, I love your books, they read just like fiction? Well, I take that as a compliment. Uh, I, my, one of my books was on the bedside table of a lady who was interviewed by, by Vanity Fair, and uh, she said, I love to read historical novels. This was uh, Washington's, Washington Crossing the Delaware. And that's not a historical no, novel. No, but... Uh, How do you I, feel about historical novels? I think they're a great model for us when it comes to storytelling. And uh, we, we're not trained to that. And, uh, and we can learn from, what, from how they do it. We meaning historians? Historians, professional historians, yes. When did you first start writing in the narrative form? Or I think you call it braided? A braided narrative. narrative. What I, is that? I, I came to that um, it, it, by degrees, but mainly I started with the, the book on Paul Revere. And uh, I'd had a sense that before then, we'd been through two stages of the old political history and the new social history. And uh, both had done some things very well and others badly, and I wanted to combine their strengths. So that led me to try to tell a story in a braided narrative, and Paul Revere was the result. And braided means? It means uh, different things going on. It means it's a story about people making choices and choices making a difference in the world. And so I worked with first braiding the story of the choices that Paul Revere was making against General Gage on the British side. And then in, in Mrs. Gage and Mrs. Revere and uh, uh, many people if, throughout the, the, the area that, that Paul Revere lived in. You, is this what you call contingency? By, by contingency, I mean choices. Uh, other people have different ideas. Uh, when uh, Stephen Jay Gould was telling the story of the Burgess shale fossils and trying to rework the history of evolution, he introduced what he called contingency to mean accidents. And then uh, my colleague James McPherson uh, uh, did his book on the Civil War around contingency, and he meant turning points. And I have another way of thinking about and it. And what is uh, yours? It's people making choices that way. And it's a way of getting beyond the heavy determinism we had uh, 10, 20 years ago. Can you give an example of it? Of contingency? Mm -hmm. It would be uh, uh, the, the people in, on, the, on the American side uh, thinking about how the war would start. They were quite sure in the spring of 1775 that they'd come to that point. And they wanted to make very sure that it would start in ways that joined people to their cause. And so among the messages Paul Revere was carrying was one that instructed the, the Minutemen uh, to, uh, in, in the towns to come out uh, when the regulars appeared as they were expected to and to stand by the road and constitute an army of observation, but not to fire the first shot. It was a choice that Samuel Adams made. He said, put your enemy in the wrong and keep him there. It's the best way in politics as well as war. And so they went into the, into the war uh, making sure that the first shot was fired by the other side. A decision, and uh, therefore... It was a choice, mm -hmm. and a good many of our leaders have done that uh, in the World War II, World War I. Uh, the Fort Sumter crisis for the North. Other leaders have not done that and have gone in with a divided country. And uh, then we get into trouble. And now you've also written about more recent times, especially in your, your newest book. Yes. Would you say uh, in recent years presidents have used this? I think every president makes choices and we've seen some who've been very conscious of the same sorts of uh, concerns that, that Samuel Adams had. Uh, others were thinking more of different things. So. Now, um, in the acknowledgments for your Paul Revere book, I couldn't mm -hmm. help but notice a story you tell, since you bring up James McPherson, and here's a picture of the two of you. Where's yes. this taken? This was in his kitchen uh, in Princeton, and uh, I was down to give, a, give a, 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 a talk on Washington's Crossing. That's a bottle of champagne, two editors hard at work there, <laughs> and, which was sent to us by our editor at the Oxford Press. Uh, he and I are friends for uh, 40 years. We went to graduate school together at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and then uh, we uh, decided to try to do a series of books around the theme of contingency. And it's called Pivotal Moments in American History. Uh, Jim did a book on Antietam. Uh, my book was Washington's Crossing. Uh, the logo for the series is the lantern in the Old North Church. And we've, our sixth book has just come out. Uh, it's John Farrelling on the election of 1800. Uh, and uh, I think we've got about 25 uh, 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 in progress 
at the at the moment. Uh, James McPherson has sat in this chair for three hours during our ser uh, during our series, also. So I'm sure our viewers are, are very familiar with his books, also. Uh, when you when you were right when you wrote in your acknowledgments, however, you told a story about you and James McPherson going out to a Civil War battlefield and yes. how contingency played into your life there. We were uh, both, uh, we, were, we were doing a, a Princeton Alumni College uh, and we wanted to scout out some of the sites. We had a wonderful time on the Delta Queen steamboat and we uh, followed the Western campaigns of the Civil War and got a little too close uh, to, to Fort Henry uh, and deep in the mud had to uh, walk miles to, to get some assistance to get out again. And in, in the process, we were talking about contingency, even as we were living it in our own, uh, in, in, in that moment. I want to uh, ask you about the, uh, the introduction of your newest book, Liberty and Freedom. And I, found, I came across one sentence that I thought was interesting, and, and you asked you to explain it. You say this, that in the study of history, every answer becomes another question. Yes, I, I'm very much conscious of history as a, as inquiry. You asked me for the books that are most important to me, and mm -hmm. first on the list was Herodotus. Herodotus called his book The Histories, and that meant inquiries, the inquiries of Herodotus. Uh, and uh, I, I've always been, uh, been, been following that. And then I tried to write my books in, in this storytelling mode around a series of, uh, of discoveries that I've made and the reader is invited to become a, become a part of. We have your complete list that we can show our viewers now. These again are some of your favorite mm -hmm. history books and uh, I couldn't help but notice the Alexis de Tocqueville one, three yes. down. Why is de Tocqueville Well, here's the other, you? another part of this, that it, the contingencies come down to events, but then I'm also interested in webs and structures of choice. And that's what Tocqueville was so good at in, in his, uh, in his uh, an extraordinarily thoughtful book on, on how on how America works a, as a web of, of choices that that that, that uh, um, people make. Well, David Hackett Fisher has been writing history for many years, and we've asked him to be our guest for this month on In Depth. We're going to invite you to join us, and we'll start taking your calls in ten minutes. Here's the numbers you can call if you'd like to join us: two zero two six two eight zero two zero five. If you live in the East or Central Time Zone, two zero two seven three seven triple zero two. If you live in the Mountain or Pacific time zone, we'll also be taking your emails today. And the email address is uh, booktv at cspan.org. Now, because uh, this is being recorded uh, and shown for the first time uh, in the weekend after the election of 2004, I wanted to ask you this, which is an email that came in from a student from Bishop Kelly High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have a group of students out there who, who watch us, this program religiously and send us in their questions. They say, in the election of 2000 and this past election, many people believe that the Electoral College should be voided or dismantled. Would you agree with the statement that since it was built by our founding fathers, it would be unpatriotic to get rid of the Electoral College, or would you say that it's not applicable to modern America? I think we could do without the Electoral College, but I think we're going to have to live with it for as far into the future as I can see. It's very important to small states, and they would have to vote on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a change. Since we've so, heard so much uh, about it, can you tell us the story of it? Well, the Electoral College actually was, I think, the first Electoral College, or something like an electoral system was worked out in the Constitution of the State of Maryland in 1776. And there, it was a similar problem. It was uh, uh, bringing together very different parts of a very complex state. Uh, and uh, the electoral system there was designed uh, to do the same sort of thing. I, th I think the purpose of the Electoral College was, was primarily a, a, a federal purpose. It was uh, uh, meant to represent states as well as uh, individual uh, voters. And that was more important at the outset of American history than it is today. But it was urgently important, I think, for the founders to get that federal system working at the start. Now, we've, or, pay, excuse me, we've paid so much attention to it in the last uh, four years or so. But going back in, in history, were there earlier times in which uh, it has been in the news like, like it is it's, today? It's failed uh, uh, several times, three times in particular. Once was in the election of 18. Uh, when a tie uh, uh, developed uh, between uh, Jefferson and Burr and, and the election had to go into the House of Representatives. It was a very protracted 
crisis, even to the point where it was said that, that uh, uh, m troops were beginning to uh, muster, ready to, uh, in, in some may be even beginning to march on Washington at one step, and we, at one stage, and we came very close uh, to, a, to a major uh, crisis, even a, even a collapse of the, of the system, then, and uh, survived just by the narrowest uh, margin. It was difficult again in 1824, and once more in 1876. And uh, I think uh, it, it has gotten us into considerable trouble. But I, I, uh, sadly, I don't think we're going to be able to, to change it. Uh, because of uh, politics? Because of the, of the interest that small states have in, in, in preserving it. Is that good for democracy? Or no, it's, it's not good. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's a, 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 even a corruption, I think, in, in, the, in the system. How? Uh, in that it, uh, we're suppo I think we, we, are, uh, we, we should be representing the, 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 the people uh, now. That's, we've become a democracy, which we weren't in, in 1787 uh, uh, when, when this was uh, designed. Now, I will tell you that I have listened to many, many viewers over the many years that I've been here, and I know somebody's getting on the phone right now to say it's not a democracy, it's a republic. Yes. <laughs> it was a republic, and still is. But I, I believe that the events of, the, uh, of, our, of our history have turned it into a democracy. Uh, uh, and it's a very healthy one today. Where did you get your inspiration to become first a professor? Or was it first a professor, then a writer, or first a writer, then it a professor? It was uh, first, uh, first uh, a, a teacher, a mm -hmm. historian, and then a, then, then a writer. Two things together. I, it grew out of my uh, origins in, in Maryland. I, I, uh, I, I had, uh, I'm a, a typical American mongrel and of the most common variety, um, and very strong claims were made m on my identity, all in historical terms. The, these were the Baltimore Burger Germans, H.L. Mencken, that world, strong sense of itself. And then on my mother's side, uh, roots to, to an older Maryland, and to Pennsylvania, the Quakers, to the, to the, to the Scots-Irish in the back country. And um, all of those uh, claims put a problem to me in historical terms. And then I had lots of members of my family who were great storytellers. And I remember an aunt um, who told a story about her, uh, uh, when she was a young girl uh, in the mid-19th century. And she spoke of a, of a day uh, when she heard a sound outside of her farm door north of Baltimore. It sounded like the wind in the trees. And she went outside. There was no wind. But she looked up the road and she saw, as far as you could see, a long line of wagons with the wounded from Gettysburg. And that sound like the wind was the sound of those men. And that was told to us when we were very young. And that was the broth in which I was cooked. Uh, that's, that's a recipe for making a historian. Is this your mother? That's my mother. That would have taken, been taken about 1938. Uh, she was uh, an English and a history major in the School of General Studies at Johns Hopkins. That's my brother Miles. Which one is a you? Lawyer. I'm the older one, You're this in, the, one. in the back. Uh -huh. I think I would have been about two or three years old. Uh, there, three, I think, and my brother about, about one. And um, uh, my mother had a deep interest in history as well. And uh, my father had a great impact on me in a different way, and I think changed the sort of history I write. He, uh, in the Depression, got a job as a school teacher in, in Maryland, and uh, then uh, rose uh, very quickly to be superintendent of the Baltimore school system. And uh, then, a after I uh, uh, finished in school, went on uh, to become a president of Teachers College, Columbia University. And uh, in my uh, youth, I'd hear stories around the dining room table about, yes, the way uh, history was happening in, in the town where, where we lived. And it was a story of people making choices. And that's, uh, I think that's where I got my, my interest in, in that. Are, are either of your parents living? My father is, is uh, living. My mother passed away two years ago. And my father is still my most trusted uh, advisor. Uh, he um, uh, 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 reads my uh, uh, books and is a, a very uh, keen critic. He read the uh, conclusion to Liberty and Freedom, and I said, what do you think? He said, cut it. I had cut it considerably, and I took it back, and I said, what do you think now? He said, cut it again. And uh, he, 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 is a, uh, he, he gives me very 
very straight uh, advice. What was his uh, expertise? What he, did he, was, do? Uh, in, he was a school, in, in, he was an educational administrator, was what he was primarily. Uh, and um, he was also the head of the Baltimore School System in 1954 when Brown versus Board of Education came down. This uh, is and, pro probably uh, a more, more recent picture of him. Yes, uh, that's just a, that's only a few months ago. Uh, with uh, I think that's with my wife uh, Judy and our, our a a new grand, a new grandson Matthew, who lives here. He lives in in, in in the Washington area in Chevy Chase. Is this Matthew that's reading Matthew Grandpa's again. book? Uh, no, he's reading. I believe his father's work. He, his father is uh, in uh, 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 cognitive science and. Uh, and uh, uh, that that area. Go back to what you were saying about your fa your father and Brown versus Board. Yes, I, I, I felt as if I was a, a, a witness to that chapter of, of American history. Why? Uh, in that uh, he had uh, tales to tell. We saw that un, uh, un, uh, developing in Baltimore when uh, it came down very suddenly, and uh, people were wondering quite what to do. And my father and a and a mayor, uh, the mayor of Baltimore, his name was Thomas D'Alessandro. Uh, worked together. D'Alessandro had a very effective democratic machine, and yet he believed that good schools are good politics. And so they worked to move very quickly, and uh, there were more choices again. I, I've had occasion to talk about that with Thomas D'Alessandro's daughter, who's Nancy Pelosi, and we, uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, similar memories of of, of, our, of, of our, our, our fathers in, in moments like that. You uh, teach now at Brandeis? I do, yes. What's it like to teach at Brandeis? It's a wonderful place. My, my, again, my father says that some students learn no matter what you do to them. And I think that uh, Brandeis, is, Brandeis students are very much, very much like that. How long have you been teaching there? I've been there since 1962, uh, off and on at other places, but that's been my my, my base. Mm -hmm. I think we have some video of it. Uh, ha how, many cl how many classes do you teach? I teach mainly a one, I teach one course in one semester and two courses another. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it has about 2,800 undergraduates, about 1,000 graduate students, uh, small classes, uh, uh, the close teaching. I try to work uh, with a combination of an American lecture course and uh, an American version of an Oxford tutorial, which I've done some teaching in. But the tutorial's not centered on exams, but centered on writing papers, uh, doing independent research. Uh, this is your office and, uh, there. That's, that's where I meet with my, with my students. Do you write there too? No, I write at home in a converted garage filled to overflowing with books. Uh, my wife says her next husband will have to be illiterate. And uh, the, the, the house is just uh, uh, choked with, uh, with, uh, the, 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 with, with books. Uh. Well, let's just some, grab some calls for you, and then we'll get back and show some people <coughs> some of your older work that they may not have, have seen before. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank C-SPAN. Uh, you guys provide the most interesting and informative programming on television. Thank you very much. Dr. Fisher, uh, I, hope I, I hope you talk about your book, The Great Wave, in, in this program. However, my question is about the American Revolution. Specifically, is there any way to evaluate the accuracy of Adam's observation that the American people were divided into one-third patriots, one-third loyalists, and one-third indifferent uh, immediately before the American Revolution? There is, I think, an inaccuracy uh, there. Uh, the inaccuracy is that when John Adams said that about the American Revolution uh, in, a, uh, in a letter to a friend in Massachusetts, it turns out he was referring to the French Revolution. And many historians misread that and repeated it as a judgment on the American Revolution instead. Uh, in another letter I found in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania uh, to, uh, to James McKean, he tries to make the same estimate for the American Revolution, and there he says two-thirds for, one-third against. And I think that's probably roughly right as an average, though it varied a lot from one part of the country to another. The Great Wave. Uh, the, the, the Great Wave uh, was a very different sort of project. I've had a, a secret life as a price historian. I've never had an economics course, but I had a great teacher at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it was um, uh, uh, Frederick Lane, his name was. He was uh, an old-fashioned economic historian working mainly on the history of medieval Venice. 
And I met a, a rigor that I'd never n known before. And many of the great European historians would come to Baltimore to visit with Fred. And uh, he'd invite us uh, as well. And uh, I had the sense of being a, a, a partner in a, in, a, in a shared enterprise and started collecting materials on prices. I was mainly interested not in prices, but in change, how things change. And I found that price records are the, give us the longest run of material on, on, on change that, uh, of, of any sort of documentation. We have price records that go back th about 4,000 years. Uh, and um, uh, we have good price series for about 1,000 years. And so I put that together and looked for the rhythm of change in, in price history. And found a series of waves, in, in not cycles, nothing mm -hmm. like a Kondratiev pattern. These are not predictable uh, any more than waves in the sea, uh, but they have a very strong impact, I think, on the world where, in which we live. Can you give just an example of one of the waves? Yes. Uh, it's about four major waves of inflation, of which the last began in 1896, and we all know it very well. It reached a peak in the, in the 1970s, uh, uh, about 1980. Uh, and uh, th this was a wave of rising prices that was profoundly disruptive of, of uh, societies. I think it led partly, it was a, it partly responsible for the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, put a heavy strain on our system. And um, uh, then uh, the, the wave was driven mainly, I think, by aggregate demand, by population surging in that period. And then it broke I around 1980. And I, 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 we have another period of disinflation, then deflation, then stability, and that's what we've been in now. Uh, not um, perfect equilibrium, lots of fluctuations, mm -hmm. the oil prices that we've seen mm -hmm. recently, but no long-term price inflation. And uh, the world behaves very differently in, 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 those, in, in these periods. And you're saying that there's no way to, to uh, look forward in, under this uh, scenario and know when the next wave's we coming can't, in? We can't predict the timing. Nobody's been able to do that. They're highly variable. In, in, in their timing. But they're very similar, these great waves, in their wave-like structure, uh, which means uh, a similar uh, impact on social relations, uh, similar uh, sequences of economic events. How about the length of the, the wave? The, they vary. Some were as short as 70 years. There's one of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Others as long as about 160 in the, in the 16th century, the so-called price revolution of the of the 16th century. So they, they're, they're very different one, for, one from another. David Hackett Fisher is our guest. San Francisco, you're next. Hello. San Francisco, please speak up and go ahead. Hello. Oh, yep. Dr. Fisher. Yes. Yes, I want to thank you for being on the show this afternoon. Um, I have a question in regards to your book, uh, Albion Seed, which I've greatly enjoyed. And with our recent presidential election, uh, could you comment on maybe some of the makeup that would have been in both um, Central heritage, heritage and uh, also President Bush's heritage and how that relates to uh, some of the things that uh, President Bush may be doing uh, for the next four years. I think both, uh, it's interesting that both uh, Mr. Kerry and, and, and Mr. Bush have very strong Yankee roots, um, but, um, uh, but Mr. Bush was uh, moved to Texas at an impressionable age, and I think in cultural ways he's much more a product of what I call the back country. Uh, I, I, I know um, nothing pejorative was meant by that phrase. It was the way it was called in the 18th century. It's the world uh, uh, that stresses an idea of, of liberty as independence, uh, as personal responsibility. And uh, John Kerry's uh, 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 culture is more continuously New England. And that's, uh, that's um, a, a culture in which uh, people had a more a collective sense of responsibility. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they were town-born uh, people. And uh, they spoke in the revolution, uh, Samuel Adams, of the, of the liberty of New England, uh, the liberty of, 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 of America as a sense of collective rights. And I think we can see that difference in the way that Mr. Bush and Mr. Kerry think about the, the world. We can also see it in the electoral maps. And one thing that I observe in, in, in the maps of 2004 is a very, very strong regional pattern. Uh, New England is a, is, is a, is a solid block uh, of, of blue, and, uh, and 
the, uh, the uh, southern highlands, uh, much of the west, is a, is a sea of red. Uh, and those, that's, a, that's a cultural pattern, uh, as well as a geographical one. Uh, for people who do, are not familiar with this book, it was, I think it was published in 89? That, that's correct. And it, it what is. is it about in general? It's mainly about the origins of, of regional cultures in, in, in early, early America. I was curious to know uh, why New Englanders uh, talk with a Yankee twang. And people in the South have a different way of, of talking. And uh, there's, there are a set of Western uh, speech ways and uh, a Midland accent. And I found that in other patterns, the way we build our houses, the way we do the ordinary things in life, uh, tying in with four great migrations that happened in America from 1630 uh, to 1775. It's about those four migrations coming from different parts of England, different religious groups, different periods of British history, uh, and creating hegemonic regional cultures that uh, that persist even to this day. Uh, throughout our program today, we're going to be going through a lot of uh, different books that uh, uh, David Hackett Fisher has written. And if you just would like a list of all of them, you can go to our website. It's www.booktv.org, and you can take a list at, uh, look at all of the books that we're discussing today, as well as see some of the lists that you're mm -hmm. going to see of uh, books that have been influential to you, books that you're reading now, that type of thing. Next is Salisbury, Maryland. Hello. Hello. You're on the air. Thank you kindly, and thank you, C-SPAN. Uh, Dr. Fisher. Yes. Uh, it's just been brought to light that there was uh, thousands of uh, Negro soldiers during the Revolutionary War. Yes. And they fought on both sides because they were uh, promised their freedom. Now, I, uh, my question is, after the uh, war and the uh, things had ceased, were these uh, slaves given their freedom? How were they treated? And what effect did it have on the uh, formulation or the Declaration of Independence? I think you're absolutely right about, about African Americans in the Revolution. Many of them uh, joining very actively on both sides, just as you say. And there was a pattern to that. I th uh, the uh, the uh, uh, former slaves, nearly all of them were, were, were former slaves. That is, 90 percent, more than 90 percent, uh, were, uh, were in slavery in 1775. But the, those who had been slaves in the northern colonies, by and large, believed, this was certainly the case in New England, that they would win their freedom as a consequence of the revolution. And so they did. Uh, and they uh, took up arms. Um, on the side on, on the side of the of, of the of the American Whigs, in the South, um, many slaves uh, thought that there was no hope of, of freedom in the Revolution, uh, where their slave owners uh, were, uh, with, with, were 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 leading the, the Whig movement, and so many uh, supported the British side, once again in hope of, of their freedom. And uh, different things happened to them. Uh, many uh, were given freedom. Uh, there is a, a, a community of former Southern slaves in Nova Scotia today, others in Canada, uh, uh, some in the Bahamas. Uh, but uh, but uh, others were sold into slavery by uh, by British uh, 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 British soldiers and uh, uh, did not did not escape their, their bondage. This is the newest book by David Hackett Fisher, Liberty and Freedom, 800 and almost 50 pages. And about 600 illustrations. It's about this visions of- This is the one your, of, your father cut twice a, already. That's, he cut <laughs> twice, that's right. And, what are you uh, trying to do with this one? What I'm trying to do is to look at liberty and freedom in a, in a different way, uh, not as a scholar's abstraction uh, or, uh, or political ideology, but as beliefs that we have at a, a, a uh, acquired at a very early age, uh, uh, Tocqueville uh, spoke of, of habits of the heart, and I think that's what they are. And, and uh, every American generation has, has had a very strong sense, even an obsession with liberty and freedom, but always different in each generation, always contested. The contest always a source of growth and expansion. And through that process, I think America has become more open and free than any one of those ideas could alone would have would have been. Uh, Let's take for example uh, George Washington. Was his idea of liberty and freedom different? Uh, very uh, different. I think there was a Chesapeake idea that was very hierarchical. Edmund Burke said liberty was a, a, was a rank and privilege to them, uh, and it was a world in which people at the top had many liberties, and those 
at the bottom had few or even none if they were slaves. Uh, but in New England, it was that sense of the town-born people having that idea of liberty as participation. And the Quakers had a, had a sense of liberty as, a, as something that belonged to all humanity. Uh, they put a phrase on that bell that they used to commemorate their Charter of Liberties that said, proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And the people in the back country used the rattlesnake as their symbol and it said, don't tread on me. It was that very individual idea. And we found something like 600 images of liberty and freedom that are reproduced in this book. Uh, and uh, the images were a shorthand for a symbol of a vision. A and these visions, I think, are the drivers of, of American history. This book comes up to present time. It comes to the present. And then a little bit beyond it in another sense, I, I'm wondering what's happening in the world today. And uh, it, the book ends with a look at liberty and freedom, I, visions, ideas, symbols in India, in China, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and again, a great variety of, of, of visions. And I think we're seeing the world moving toward liberty and freedom, but on many different roads. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an expansion, uh, I think, of the story that, that I tell for America, but with different meanings, uh, uh, different drivers. Uh, and, but I end with an image of liberty uh, with the motto, hope, beneath. And that's, what, uh, 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 that's, that's the, the, the message of the, of the book. And you, uh, if I'm correct, you say that uh, September 11th changed Americans' definitions of liberty and freedom. Well, I think it, 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 its first effect was to deepen our sense of, of, of collective belonging. Uh, all of those signs and symbols, I include uh, some of them uh, here in, in the book. And I think everybody will remember seeing them along, uh, along the roads. But then as we began to act, I think the Afghan war uh, united, kept, uh, continued that sense of unity. We all supported that. On Iraq, we divided. Uh, and uh, in, that, in that division, we are, I, I think, developing um, more and different ideas of liberty and freedom. Back to the phone calls, Boston. Hello. Yes, Professor Fraser. Yes. Hi, uh, we, uh, I, I've had the privilege of studying with you at Brandeis for a while. I'd like to thank you for all the teaching you've given for me. I, I'm, I'm not told your name. Is that uh, permitted? Uh, but of go course, ahead with of your... Of course it is. Uh, but he may be looking for a grade here, you realize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. I, I did just fine. Uh, the name is Michael Goldsmith. Oh, uh, hello, Michael. I, uh, I'm glad to, glad to talk with you again. Uh, it, was, it was great to see you today. And I want to thank C-SPAN for uh, recognizing how, uh, how great you've uh, done for American history and the things <laughs> that you've done for us. And um, I was just interested in asking you a question about the war in Iraq. We've just been speaking about yes. the differing philosophies about professing, uh, presidents going to war and speaking about Samuel Adams saying that you should be um, the, putting the enemy in the wrong and keeping him there, firing the first shot, etc. How do you think that uh, September 11th changed uh, George Bush's views of that strategy? Uh, I tend to think that um, that uh, Mr. Bush and many of the people with him uh, uh, came to believe deeply in a preemption, um, uh, partly because they thought that the first shot had already been fired. I, they, they regarded 9-11 as the first shot. And I think so it was uh, for most Americans uh, when we went into Afghanistan. But Americans were, uh, were divided on the question of what to do about Iraq. And uh, the case there was not, was not made. I, I think perhaps it could have been in a stronger way. Uh, the other, another thing that happened here was that every American war uh, has begun by, in some ways, uh, restricting American liberties and has then uh, ended by expanding them. Uh, we saw that in the Revolution, Civil War, World War II, World War I especially. And I think we may be seeing that uh, today with some restraints on American uh, liberties today. And, uh, uh, and yet I'm confident that we're also seeing a process by which uh, in the, in the uh, 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 rulings of the courts and, and, and other things uh, that these ideas will keep, will keep growing. Tucson, hello. Hello. You're on the air, sir. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I would like to uh, take issue with Mr. Fisher on his uh, 
<laughs> concept of our evolving from a democratic republic to a uh, democracy and it wasn't the purpose of the electoral college to protect the small states yes to th- give them a voice and if you go to a strictly democratic uh, <coughs> voting system <coughs> then as shown in the red and the blue there was about 30 states went Bush and about 20 states uh, went uh, to the to the Democrats and uh, the popular the populated states the metropolitan areas would control the country and I'll hang up and uh, get your answer yes thank you for your your question I think Americans have always uh, disagreed on that uh, on 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 those issues the the first issue is about whether we are or are not a democracy and uh, I, to, to me American history is a is a process by which uh, we've moved steadily toward more a uh, popular engagement in 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 in, in, uh, in in this in this system in 1776 only two American states elected their governors. Uh, after the revolution, that began to grow, and uh, now uh, popular election uh, has, has spread throughout the system. Uh, the same thing has happened uh, in the Senate uh, as well. And we can see more and more people voting for more officers in a more open electoral process. And so democracy has developed on all three of those lines. I tend to believe that our republic rests not on the states but on the people and that may be our our deepest uh, disagreement if you're right uh, then one could say that uh, America is a republic of the states if I'm right it's a democracy of the people Oklahoma City hello good morning hello professor good morning good morning Uh, when I was uh, 14 years old in 1954 I think it was uh, I picked up a copy of Great English Philosophers, and in that book was an essay by Mr. Locke. And I got up to the point where he said, Consent of the Governed. And I don't remember reading the rest of that essay. <clears throat> but that concept has always been important to me. And, of course, that begs for consent of the governed. And I was wondering if you thought that the role of the Fourth Estate in our country uh, oppose a democracy and if so why is it that so many areas the viewpoints are totally right or left uh, democratic or republic and uh, if uh, if it if it is important then Do you think that they have fulfilled their function in the recent past and maybe will continue to do so in the future? And thank you for your answer. Thank you for the question. I I, I share one part of your your question very much. I'm also uh, troubled by the polarization left and right, uh, which has been growing so rapidly recently uh, and uh, not only polarized I see that increasing uh, increasingly our politics as uh, some of our media are polarized sharply to the, to the right other of uh, other parts of our, our media and academe are polarized very much to the left and so, so great is this distance now that academic uh, the people and uh, many in 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 public office don't even communicate with one another, uh, and and they 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 have a sense of, of of the others as them in some distant and very dangerous way. I'm very much a person of the center. I uh, and I, I think of the center not merely as a compromise between left and right, but a position that has its own uh, coherence and integrity. And I'd like to see much more in the way of the voices from the center. I believe that most Americans are in the center. Uh, I think they tend to be a little left of center on domestic questions, a little right of center on foreign policy and and, and security. That's exactly where I am as well. Uh, And that's a view that is not represented in the choices 
that sometimes we're asked to make. In 1978, David Hackett Fisher wrote this book, Growing Old in America. Now, this is, <clears throat> would seem a departure from your newer work, but what were you working on that got you to this topic? Well, I was at that stage uh, in the 60s and 70s, late 60s, 70s, working in what was then called the new social history. We were, uh, we had a sense that the old political history, in which I'd begun, was too narrow and constraining. And so we were interested in the ordinary experiences of ordinary people. And we were also interested in the structures of things. So this was a book about America as a set of age relations. And it was about the experience of growing old as it was normally experienced by people in this in this country. And, uh, you, you wrote in here that the public careers of men such as John Winthrop, William Bradford, Roger Williams, and William Byrd provide strong evidence that the prestige of age was often translated into political power. In early America. In early America. And then yeah. uh, changing uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in the 19th and still more in the 20th century. I was curious to know um, uh, it, it, to find an empirical way to discover how people felt about growing old and how their feelings changed through time. And I discovered it in uh, what's called age heaping in the census. When people report their ages to the census, they're apt to bend the truth a, a bit. And there's a bulge at the age 39, 49, 59, even I'm told 89. Uh, and people are, are bending their ages down a little bit, which tells us that um, uh, they, uh, they'd rather be younger. Uh, and in early America, the age heaping shows in a little different way, but it shows that people uh, biased their ages up when they reported them. They wanted to make themselves older than, in fact, they were. And I think that's a very interesting phenomenon. It changed around the time of the American Revolution. Uh, and, the, and a bias toward youth has been strong and maybe growing stronger since. And the book was an appeal for another way of thinking about aging, in which um, we could value both youth and age at the, same, in the, at the same time. I was interested in the one thing that you said. You talked about um, the elderly, I think, in, the early, in early America, being even more estranged um, emotionally at, uh, as well as yes. uh, physically, and that many times the, the young people were only um, <clears throat> were forced to respect the elderly. So yes, it, wasn't, in, it wasn't something uh, in New England, warm and cuddly. People, yes, I think that's exactly right. In New England, people, uh, um, uh, men married at, at an average age of, of 26, but they didn't get their land until they were well into their 30s. And in that very difficult period, they were dependent on their, on their parents uh, in a way that they didn't wish to be. And there were great stresses in this world where older people had power in a way that they don't quite Today. And yet today in the, in, in the political races, we see sometimes someone's experience is pushed and sometimes someone's youth is pushed. Yes. You're saying for the most part, youth works over age? I think for the most part, in, in the, at least in the 20th century, uh, uh, that, that uh, our, our culture has a very strong youth bias. Uh, and um, other cultures, Japan, are very different. Uh, uh, in America, people spend a lot of money on cosmetics to make themselves look younger. I'm told that in Japan there are cosmetics for deepening wrinkles, for making people look a little older in a society that greatly respects uh, their elders. Foreign philosophy to some of us. Yes. <laughs> Next is San Francisco. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. You're on the air. I'm uh, an octogenarian who uh, is more concerned with egalitarianism than with libertarianism. And I wonder in your book on the... Um, uh, on equality, on, on freedom and liberty, uh, whether you've dealt with the conflict between these two concepts or ideals. Well, I've, I was uh, struck to, to, uh, by the fact that I think through much of American history, one idea of equality uh, uh, was most widely shared, and it was an idea of equal rights, equal rights. And it, it seems to me that that is something that has been growing uh, through American history. Uh, perhaps not as as rapidly as 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 many would w would wish, uh, but we can see that that progress of of equal rights often very painful and sometimes with reversals. Sometimes these revolutions run in reverse, uh, but in terms of gender, uh, in in terms of of ethnicity, 
I think uh, we've, we've made a real gains. And when we look at those movements, we see ideas of liberty and freedom joined to an idea of equality in this connection of equal rights. We're showing a picture of Malcolm X from your book right here, just yes. to give some examples of it. And also, here's a photo from the Olympics in the... In the yes, book. and before that, the, 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 the photos of the civil rights movement, uh, which were very powerful that way. But it's interesting to see that, that uh, Martin Luther King was always very careful to keep the emphasis in, his, in the civil rights movement on rights and freedom. Uh, but it was his way of moving toward equal rights. Next is Rockford, Illinois. Hello. Yes, hello, Dr. Fisher. Yes. Uh, I am uh, curious to know, in the post-Civil War era now that we've been living in, why is it that still certain regions of the country identify themselves more as by their state first or region first, and while, like, say, the Midwest and New England states identify themselves primarily as Americans, and rarely will you hear the term like Midwesterner or New Englander. And is this because how history is taught in the public schools is different in those parts of the country? Or I, uh, what was the reason for that still in this post-World War II era even? Well, I, I tend to think the key is not so much what happens in the schools, but what happens in our families. Uh, we learn our history first and our ideas of liberty and freedom when we are very small. And I, I'm, I'm struck by the persistence of regional differences in America, st still very strong, muted in some ways, but, but very strong. And I, I think that New England Yankees learn to think in Yankee ways uh, when they are very young, and the same uh, for Westerners and, 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 and Southerners. And this, these, these processes of, of education at home or I think as powerful as they have ever been before. Even though culture has taken more time from parents away from their children? Yes, and, and what also is striking to me is how eth ethnic patterns will change in regions. But regional uh, ways of thinking and acting will, will stay the same. For example, uh, when, Irish, when Irish immigrants moved to New England, uh, they learned to... Uh, they learned the culture of New England. They learned the speech ways of, of New England. Uh, John Kennedy's uh, uh, speech was, was, uh, was, was Yankee speech. But when they moved to Texas, they learned to talk with the Texas twang and to think of that Texas idea of, of liberty. And we can see how powerful these, 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 these educational processes are before out, they get to school. Out to the West Coast, Saratoga, California. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, Dr. Fisher, I, I've been listening to uh, your background in education, and I'd like to uh, throw out uh, a, a stupid uh, uh, definition of postmodernism. Uh, that would be that uh, everything has a cultural interpretation, and just leave it at that, but that connected with that is a notion that truth is a power struggle, and that's all it is and that uh, uh, the um, w one society or um, moral system is as good as any other. Uh, that's the culture relative is a part of it. Um, and uh, what I am interested in is any comments you might make about uh, fear of a two-tier society or particularly what uh, interests me is uh, the notion of merit, uh, that is, uh, you know, gender and race trumping an objective measure of uh, uh, academic uh, ac achievement, that's about it. Well, uh, on the subject of postmodernism, I, I, I got into that a bit in the, um, in the appendices of my book on Washington's Crossing and, and Paul Revere's Ride. I was very much interested in how people remember those events and how they think about memory uh, in, in general. And in the 20th century, uh, quite a number of critics began to uh, argue that our uh, official or received idea of Washington's Crossing, in general, in the painting in particular, uh, was a myth and a humbug or a purely a cultural construction. There were three or four ways of doing that. One was what we invented a new word to describe in 19. 23, 24, the word was debunking. And people love to debunk American history and point out the flaws uh, in 
the Loitze painting or uh, whatever. Then in the 70s, it was an iconoclastic mood, which argued that people were incapable of behaving the way we think that some of our forebears behaved in the revolution, uh, that uh, the hero tales don't describe our condition. And then more recently, uh, quite a few people in the universities and outside are into the postmodernist idea that history, all of history, is a cultural construction. And it scarcely matters, so one shouldn't even bother to ask what actually happened. If I believed that, I wouldn't be a historian. I, I tend to think that, uh, that history happened in the way that it happened and not in any other way, uh, even as we can tell many different stories ab about it. And much of my work uh, has, is an attempt to, to find ways of trying to tell those stories in ways that are accurate and also discovering when we're making mistakes. I, the, the, uh, Dostoevsky's idea that the worst lies we tell are the lies we tell ourselves about this thing. And how can a historian keep himself honest in all of this? I wrote a book called Historian's Fallacies, which is an attempt to, to answer uh, that, uh, that question. On the subject of merit and race and gender, uh, my views, I think, are somewhere intermediate, if I understand you correctly, between the position I think you w defend and the one that you're attacking, uh, in that uh, here again, I'm looking for a middle way. And uh, I, I, uh, I think that we should, um, in our educational systems, uh, support uh, 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 young people uh, who need help. I would not be in favor of affirmative action by race, but I would favor affirmative action in a broader way uh, for, um, uh, for, for youngsters. Uh, who are uh, 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 who can use a, 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 a hand up, and I think most Americans uh, accept that they don't like racial stereotyping, uh, but they do want to lend a hand, and I think that's the American way. I now that you've you've brought up the let's see, let's see painting, the, the uh, one yes, that I want to just show it to our viewers because you only get a small part of it on the front uh, uh, cover of your book, but here it is in the photo of the portrait that you have inside. Now, the debunking part of it would have been some of what you talk about at the beginning of your book, that the American flag wasn't even the it hadn't official... Been, hadn't been invented yet. Hadn't been invented yet, yes, so this is a little... This is a little and rough. a long list of, uh, uh, of, uh, of errors uh, might, might be... Might, might Washington be, wouldn't have stood this out. way. And, uh, or, uh, and uh, what I suggest is uh, that, uh, in fact, there was a deeper truth in that painting about the, 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 the uh, desperation of these men, uh, the urgency of the event, the small scale of the event, and yet its very large uh, significance. And so if some of, the, some of these things were wrong, others were right, and even some of the details that the debunkers love to debunk may turn out to be correct after all. I think it was certainly the case, I think it was almost certainly the case that Washington did stand up in the boat because it was uh, full of ice water. Uh, and um, it would have been very difficult to do otherwise. I was curious uh, uh, on the, the life of this portrait, of this painting. Yes, and, and many other uh, paintings uh, that, that followed it. Uh, I, a, a great many major American artists have painted Washington crossing the, the Delaware, never twice in the, in the same way. And I reproduce about 20 or 30 of them in the back of the, back of the book. Next is Long yeah. Island. Hello. Hello. Go ahead, you're on the air. Uh, hello, Dr. Fisher. I enjoyed reading uh, Washington's Crossing very much, and I want to thank C-SPAN for informing me about it from an earlier interview with you. Uh, my question is, uh, in your book, The Great Wave, uh, did you find that prices of some commodities rose at a much higher rate than that of others? And if so, was there a major factor uh, causing this, such as uh, the degree of labor involved or the scarcity of materials or perhaps some other factors you may have found? Yeah, the short answer is yes, I did find that. And in periods of inflation, uh, these long waves, the four long waves, always the price relatives were the same, and the most rapid rises were in the price of food and energy in every, in every way. That was, we remember that vividly in, in the 1970s, and it was also the case in the 18th century with firewood and so forth. And I think what was driving it was that um, pressure of, of, of an expanding population, and it was the supply of the necessities of life uh, that were most uh, uh, difficult to, to increase in proportion to the demand. 
uh, the, the prices that were least inflationary were the manufactured goods, again as it was in the, in, in, in the 20th century. Uh, then in the, in, in, in the periods of disinflation or of comparative price equilibrium, it was the reverse. It was the, manu the, 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 uh, the, the price of food and, and, and fuel tended to, uh, tended to fall relative to other prices. Another part of that was a change in, in, in real wages, which fell during periods of inflation and rose during the other, uh, the other, uh, the other, the, the equilibrium periods. I think that's a key to the social impact of these of, of, of these movements. In the mid '60s, you had published this book, *The Revolution of American Conservatism*. What were you looking that, at? Well, that's that was my first published book. It was my dissertation. And uh, in that period, I was working as a political historian, mainly, as most historians were. Uh, and it was, um, uh, it was about the, the, the Federalist Party in the, in the, in the period, in the, in the early republic. I was looking for, um, looking, uh, looking for, uh, it was a question about how um, America became uh, democratized, as I believe it did. Some of our, our, our viewers will not agree, but, but uh, I, 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 many historians, uh, believe that America was nowhere a democracy in 1775, in, our, in any meaningful sense of the word, but that it, it was democratic by 1828, and one historian has written that uh, Andrew Jackson did not create democracy in America, it was the medium in which he, he swam. So the question was, when did, we, when did people begin to vote in large numbers? And the answer, I think, in most states was, in the early republic, when the Federalists and the Jeffersonians were really going at each other, and there was a fierce competition for, for votes. Uh, then, after the Federalists collapsed, a party part a participation in politics fell off and rose again and stabilized at very high levels in 1840. My measure of democracy, or, or the proportion of people who vote in a free electoral process, and that's what I was tracking. Montana's next, Fort Benton. Uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, my question is on Albion's Seed, a book that I thoroughly enjoyed. And in your preface to that book, you indicate that there are a number of follow-on volumes yes. that are being uh, that were being produced. And I was wondering if, in fact, they were ever published. Uh, they are coming. One of them has just come. The Liberty and Freedom book is it will be the third volume in that series. That has just was just published. Uh, last week, uh, and um, uh, it carries on s some of the themes that are in Albion. I have another book that is to be volume two, uh, which is uh, about, it's called, uh, maybe called American Plantations, I, I was still thinking about the title, but it's going to be about um, African cultures moving to America, uh, a, a process similar to what I described for English cultures, that is, co the, uh, the, the, the slave trade as a series of very di distinct cultural movements from different parts of Africa to different parts of, of the United States. Uh, and my wife and I have been traveling in Africa. We've been to five of the, of the countries which we think are particularly important in this process. We still have about four to go, uh, and some of them are, are very difficult to get into at the moment. So we've been moving more slowly as we wait uh, for um, conditions um, to make it possible for us to do research in the Congo, in Angola, and uh, in, in, uh, in other parts of, uh, of Africa, as we have already been able to do in Ghana, in Mali, in Senegal, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. And um, so that book is slower coming. Uh, but volume three is out, and volume four may be coming in a year or two. It'll be called Deep Change, and it's more or less as described. Um, uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the introduction to, to, to Albion. I've also been distracted by other interests. Uh, I began to get into the question of storytelling, which drew me into Paul Revere and George Washington, and that slowed me down on this series. But the series is still going on, and uh, we'll, we'll continue. Have, have Paul Revere and uh, Washington's Crossing been more lucrative? They, yes, they have, no question. They've reached a larger, a, a larger uh, market. My, my bestseller is actually a book called Historian's Fallacies, which is now in its 37th printing, uh, and it's widely used as a, as, a teaching, as, a, as a teaching book. Next is uh, Richmond. Hello. 
Oh. Hello. You're on the Hello. air, sir. Uh, Dr. Fisher. Yes. Uh, I have a sort of personal question to ask you. Uh, where did your family immigrate from? Well, they came from. Uh, I'm a very have a very mixed ancestry. Uh, my, uh, a good part of my ancestors are German, and they mostly came from West Germany, uh, from Hamburg in the Hamburg area, uh, from from Hesse Cassel, uh, where where the Germans came from. And my my uh, English ancestors uh, came. Uh, some of them uh, were Quakers who came uh, from uh, the area that I describe in Albion. Uh, in uh, the North Midlands, uh, uh, the, with names such as uh, Cox, uh, uh, Pennington, Ford, they moved into the Delaware Valley. Then they worked their way south to Cecil County, Maryland, where some of my roots are. Others of my ancestors uh, came from the south of England and went to uh, Virginia. And then there were there were people in my family who were descended uh, from uh, fr fr from the people from North Britain, the borderers that I talk about in Albion. Uh, one of my aunt's uh, maiden names was Westmoreland, and it was from these th those northern counties. And so three out of four of the folk cultures in Albion were in my family tree, and I married a Yankee to complete the set and now live in, in New England. Did you have a follow-up to that, Richmond? Richmond's gone. Let me ask you um, about the role that your wife plays in yes. your work. You mentioned that she, she works and researches with you. What? She is a, a botanist, a biologist, has her own career, uh, taught uh, biology at Lesley College, and now uh, does uh, consulting work uh, in, in, in a variety of ways. And she keeps very, very busy uh, on her own projects. Uh, she's been advising people in Qatar on the, on the, on the creation of new high schools for girls in Qatar uh, with much instruction in English and um, uh, a very interesting uh, story. So when we go travel around, um, um, she, we, we both historicize and botanize. I, she helps me in the archives and when she goes for specimens, I paddle her canoe. I think I've got the better of that, uh, of that deal. Santa but, Barbara, uh, California, hello. Hi, Dr. Uh, Fisher, I was wondering if you could comment on the transition of our democracy um, throughout our history and if if our democracy will continue with the advent of electronic voting machines. I think that our democratic republic, as I would like to call it, is an experiment and uh, in every generation one might say the outcome is in, is in doubt. Uh, and uh, through uh, all these many generations various uh, challenges have, have been uh, presented and so far we've been able to to deal with them, we're going to be facing yet more and urgent ones uh, ahead. As to electronic voting, I think we're going to be able to make that work. I can imagine a system where with electronic touchscreen voting and yet with a paper trail, much in the way that we use an, an, an automatic teller machine, which has the, the automatic teller system has very little uh, trouble with inaccuracy. They have to get things right all the time and pretty nearly they, they succeed. I think we can make that work uh, in our, uh, in our uh, democratic re republic, but we'll do it probably in at least 50 different ways as each state uh, finds its own, finds its own uh, solution. Is there a historical context for this uh, controversy over how we vote? Well, Whether there there's is. Other uh, there's a, of time? a wonderful book by, uh, by Alex Kasar on the history of of voting in America, which I, which I recommend. It, it's one of so many really interesting projects that historians have, have been doing, but we've been debating how we should vote for a very long time. And in the early Republic, it was a choice between what was called viva voce uh, or outcry voting, people actually voting out loud. And in uh, Connecticut, when uh, 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 one party wanted to control uh, the outcome. They actually re passed what was called the stand-up law. People were not only required to vote out loud, but to stand up before others and proclaim their their vote. And then uh, there was much um, uh, uh, there was a strong movement for secret ballot, uh, which uh, many people thought might be the end of the republic. Uh, and yet, in it came, and I think it was a step forward. Uh, as these other changes, I think, in the end. Will be. What was the premise of the, the, the push for secret ballot? Uh, the, the, uh, the possibility of corruption, 
uh, was, I think, one of the, the same fears that are generated around, uh, around electronic voting today. If you've just joined us, we are spending three hours this afternoon with David Hackett Fisher, a historian, professor at Brandeis. Uh, this, on the first Sunday of every month, we invite an author who has a large body of work to come and speak about their complete body of work, not just about their new book, although there is a new book. And David Hackett Fisher is our guest uh, this month. We have two hours left, and we go next to Lakefield, Minnesota. Yes. Hi, Connie. Hi. And Mr. Fisher. Hello. Um, I started being very interested in our history uh, about 30-some years ago when an, uh, an old set of Encyclopedia Britannica that had been uh, published in the 1880s, I happened to buy at an auction and uh, got interested in reading and found a very different uh, history than what I had been taught in school. Uh, so I'd like to ask you a couple of questions uh, that I didn't learn there, but one of them is uh, a question I learned in this. Uh, one of them I learned on C-SPAN just recently, but I didn't hear very much about it. Was there a man named Thompson, I believe his name was, that was one of the founding fathers that um, was for total democracy, uh, letting all the people of this country vote, including women and Native Americans and so on, and that we haven't heard very much about because the other founding fathers didn't agree with him. I, and also, I'd like to know what you have to say about Robert Owen, uh, who was uh, a socialist from England who came to this country and, according to my old set of Encyclopedia Britannica, was the father of socialism, known as that in his time and was very much instrumental in some of the things that happened in this country, including his son going on to be part of the um, uh, Lincoln administration and being part of the abolitionist papers. Can you answer those two questions? Yes, the two very interesting American stories. I think you're thinking of Charles Thompson in Pennsylvania, and uh, the, 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 a, a large group of people in Pennsylvania uh, took a much more democratic and egalitarian view of the revolution than did uh, uh, Americans in other parts of the country. I think this was partly due to the Quaker origins of, uh, of, of many of those families and uh, with that sense of equality that was in, 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 in the religion of the, of the Society of Friends. And, uh, and in fact, um, some, in some, at least one uh, state, uh, women were uh, allowed to vote for a brief period uh, during, after the, the American Revolution. It was in the state of New Jersey. And uh, women were enfranchised under the Constitution of New Jersey. Uh, and uh, that continued until 1807 when conservatives complained that women were changing their dresses and voting twice. Uh, and there were other uh, uh, other uh, issues as as well, and uh, that uh, the, the, and, and women's voting was uh, was abolished uh, in 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 New Jersey. Uh, so there was a considerable dispute in in the revolution over just how broad uh, the, the, the the republic would would be, and um, in, but in general there was a process of expansion that was started in that period and has kept on ever since. As to, the, as to, as to Robert uh, Dale Owen and uh, uh, his family, uh, that's another big and very interesting story in that uh, America in the 19th century probably attracted more socialists than any European country, many of them uh, migrating to America, establishing um, communities uh, in, the, in the West uh, as, as Owen himself uh, uh, did. And they also uh, contributed considerably, uh, some of them, to the Republican Party, which began uh, with a very a mixed character. Uh, uh, the, the many Republicans, when the party was first uh, created in the 1850s, were, uh, were really very radical in, in, in their outlook. Uh, and then the, the, the party slowly uh, uh, changed uh, to a more conservative orientation uh, thereafter. The, uh, this is an emailer, John Hansen, who saw the list of your um, favorite books up on the screen, which we've just put up again. And he is surprised, he says, surprised and delighted to find Francis Parkman on your list. He said he seems to be out of favor now, presumably because he's not politically correct. Your thoughts? He, he is, uh, Francis Parkman is out of favor amongst my colleagues, uh, 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 largely for um, 
uh, uh, politically incorrect uh, passages on the American Indians. And um, I like Parkman uh, in another way altogether as a, as a storyteller. And more than that, as a historian who went about his work in a way that's inspired me, his, his advice was for historians, always go there, go to the scene, experience what you can of it. And he did that in, in the North Woods of, 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 of America, and it made a difference in his description. So I, he's on my list because I've tried to live by his advice. And uh, when I, um, I was writing a, a, a Paul Revere, I not only uh, covered, tried to cover that ground as he did, but I um, uh, spent some time with a writing teacher. Uh, and uh, learned uh, uh, things about about horses that I couldn't have known in any other way. That made a difference in the way that I I, I wrote that uh, I wrote that that book. I'm now working on another book about Samuel de Champlain, and we're going everywhere that Champlain went as best we can uh, we can we can learn. Again, with this idea of Francis Parkman's model in mind. And for Washington's Crossing, what did you do? Well, the same thing. My uh, my. Uh, Colleague Jim McPherson and I uh, walked the route of all those marching armies on on uh, at the same time of year, and it, it that experience changed the contents of the book considerably. I I had uh, thought in my rambles as a Princeton undergraduate that uh, that uh, New Jersey was flat, but I discovered it was anything but. As I covered that ground, and you'll see a chapter called the Ordeal at Jacobs Creek, which grew from that uh, from that experience. Was so. it in this book that you also have even the weather, the history of the weather yes, during uh, the period, I, in, back in the appendices? Yes, I, I, I did. I, I wanted to document that also for Paul Revere's ride. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and th I thought that the weather was vitally important to, to what happened there, and not only to the conditions, but to the thinking of the choices that people were making. Uh, there's a Yankee um, uh, folk uh, 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 a motto that some folks are weather wise and some folks are otherwise and I found that a general that general Washington was weather wise and general Howe and general Cornwallis were otherwise and that made a that made a difference in the in the way the events played out the Beaufort North Carolina uh, good afternoon dr. Fisher how are you fine thanks good uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, my family came from northern England near the Scottish border. They were originally Harkers, and uh, that was early in the 17th century. But I have two questions having to do with uh, your books. Would I be advised to buy both Albion's uh, Seed and the Liberty and Freedom, or do they both get covered in Liberty and Freedom? I uh, I think that uh, the the book that would be closest to 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 what to to your your question. Is, uh, is is Albion's seed uh, uh, one fourth of that book is is about the migration from the north of England and the lowlands of Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, to uh, mainly to uh, uh, to the Southern Highlands, and I think that would come closest to, to home. Then I pick up that story and take it farther in uh, in, in in Liberty and Freedom, and uh, I think both of them would. Uh, I'll buy both. <laughs> My second question is this. Uh, many of us are aware of the, um, the Bush family's involvement with Saudi Arabian oil interests and, um, and, the, and the, the Islam interests in uh, the country today. Do you foresee a disastrous effect from this fallout? Uh, and how do you think it affects uh, the notion of democracy at large when we're dealing with a uh, theocratic monarchy such as Saudi Arabia? I uh, don't know about uh, the, about the Bush family uh, and uh, and the and, and the and, and the Saudi uh, connections. I've been uh, following it in in the newspaper, but not to the point where I could uh, express any sort of informed uh, opinion on that. I think we do have a major challenge in the Middle East. Um, uh, uh, it's a it's a challenge of finding ways of helping. Um, people in the Middle East to work out solutions to their problems that are so very difficult. That is, uh, these are countries that have been struggling um, uh, through, through much of the 20th century um, uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, 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 very difficult uh, conflicts uh, that now are exploding in the world. I think we have to work at that. 
uh, not in an imperialist way, not in a way of telling them what to do, not holding up our system as a model for them, uh, but, uh, but helping them to find, uh, to find a, a, a solution, as we're trying to do in, in Afghanistan, in, in, in Iraq. This emailer uh, has gone to our website, and in fact, we'll put this up on the screen, your list of the, um, your most important individuals yes. in American history. And uh, he writes, or she writes, I'm not sure, that um, FDR is the only one from the 20th century. Uh, is, you, is it your view that the quality of American <clears throat> public leadership and public discourse has declined since 1900? No, I don't think it has declined. I, I think that... Uh, Actually, uh, the, the, the bias in that list is, uh, it, it comes from my idea of what importance would, would mean. And for, for me, it's people who really made a difference in, in the way uh, this country uh, works. And I think the people at the beginning uh, 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 had, had, a, had a longer reach than those uh, in, our, in our own time, at least as we can we could tell. John Winthrop, William Penn, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. Yes, and, and Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin at the end. Yes. Right. <laughs> Next is Sierra Vista, Arizona. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Hello. Um, I want to thank you for writing Albion Seed. I have used it for 14 years in a community college class in the United States history. I, they, my students have found it marvelous, engrossing, and in depth. They have spread it to their friends and family members. And as we speak, they are working on a question for a semester exam from Albion Seed. And that question is I'm going to put to you, mainly in a background form. You have a, a point in Albion Seed that folk ways from the present are found in the past and they persist. Could you tell me, um, why is this? Because that's the question they're working on. Thank you, I'll hang up. That's a really hard question. I, my answer is first that, that, that continuities, which we've tended to neglect in history, uh, require a lot of work to keep going. Uh, and it's not as if things just happen or there's some principle of inertia that would explain it. Uh, people have to work at the business of, of transmitting the culture from one generation to, uh, to, uh, to another. And I think the heavy labor of that task rests, uh, it, it goes on in our homes, uh, amongst our families, uh, in the most intimate relations of, of parents to, to children, of teachers such as yourself uh, to your students. I'd say part of that answer is what's going on in your classroom. Uh, and um, uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in, in every institution, where younger people uh, and, and, and elders uh, meet and, and talk. I noticed in several of your acknowledgments in the back of your book, you thank your students. I do. I, I, my, my, my students uh, teach their teacher in, on, many, uh, on many things. Uh, some of my books have, have come entirely out of, out of my classroom. Uh, the, the, uh, the Fallacies book came out of my teaching. And I think the, the books I'm proudest of are are, are two that were published by the history department at Brandeis. I'm the editor, and my students are the authors. And one of them is called Concord, and one of them is called called Brookline. Uh, the Concord book. This was um, this happened in the. These books were in the 70s and 80s uh, when uh, I was working in, in social history. And uh, what we did, there was a group of students, uh, seniors, writing senior honors theses, and they. Uh, they tackled the, the town of Concord, a very small town, um, uh, 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 and they were able to reconstitute the history of every family in the town from 1750 to 1850, uh, putting together the evidence of births and deaths, of, uh, of tax uh, 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 records, of voting patterns, uh, everything we could find. And then after they did that, they, the, they broke apart and each of them wrote a history of Concord, one of demographic history, one an economic history, a history of stratification, a history of politics, history of culture, history of the environment. And all of that is published in Concord. Then we did it again on Brookline. We've done it for other, other towns that we haven't published, uh, uh, one on, on uh, Nantucket, uh, uh, one on, on, on Waltham. 
And the students themselves, I think, made a major contribution here. They found things in the demographic history of New England that no demographer had, had turned up. And they got caught up in the excitement of the inquiry, back to Herodotus again, and history as inquiry. And I try to build that into my, my teaching. And these two books are, are, an, are an example. And your use of primary sources? All of these, all of these books re uh, resting not only in primary sources, but very difficult sources for the students to use. The census list, the demographic records are, are, are not easy to, to, to manage. And, and they did a terrific job. Next, oh, by the way, you said how many semesters have uh, you? Uh, I've been teaching for 85 semesters at, at Brown. 85 started, semesters. I started in, in 1962, which is, what, uh, uh, 42 years ago. Next is yeah. Alexandria, Virginia. Oh, hi. I've just been excited to hear you say that, the excitement of the inquiry. It's just so wonderful to hear all this. And thank you very much, and thank you again, C-SPAN. But may I ask, how can this all that you're talking about be filtered down into junior high and into the elementary school when they don't have the programs that are teaching any of this and and consequently they grow up to the uh, ages where they have an opportunity to vote and they don't get it because they don't understand that the liberties and the freedoms that we have are because of our history maybe you could address yourself to you know that. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I've thought a lot about that, and I, I tend to be more hopeful. I, 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 about um, 10 years ago or so, more or less, uh, I and my colleagues began to observe that our students are coming to college better prepared than they were before. Something's changing out there in the, in, in, in the, the prep, in the, in the, the quality of, uh, of teaching. And I also find that I think. Uh, uh, there's a lot of very good teaching and very inventive teaching, that history teaching, that's going on. I was just in Ohio last week at, in, uh, at uh, Ashland in Ohio and uh, talking with a group of about 100 teachers in uh, Ohio, Michigan, uh, some from Virginia. And they were, uh, they, they, they were very inventive in uh, developing ways of reaching their their students engaging their students it's not i think a matter of filtering down but rather students launching their own inquiries uh, which they're doing there's a problem that they were having uh, in ohio particularly aware uh, of, of the new exam system is uh, very demanding of time in a classroom and they have to spend much of their of their class time teaching to exams which i think is is very is very difficult i i also met that in Massachusetts. I was teaching to a, 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 a teaching a teacher who taught in South Boston, uh, a class. She was herself of Irish ancestry, and she most of her students. And she said she'd worked out a, a unit on Gaelic history. And she said my class came alive when I was teaching that. And then her eyes filled with tears, and she said, "But it's not on the exam. I can't do it anymore." And I think what we have to do is to find a way of keeping the exams going, I believe in all of that, but of prying open more time and space and creating the resources so that teachers can teach to this inquiry process when history really comes alive. Well, since we're talking about kids, let's go back to that Tulsa, Oklahoma class I told you that emailed quite a lot of questions in for you. And Allie Thomas of that class said that, she says, I personally have a hard time absorbing and containing historical facts. Professor Fisher, how are you able to remember random dates and names from your vast array of historical knowledge? Well, I'd have to say at, at, at a certain stage in life, it becomes a race between learning and forgetting. And, uh, I, I, but I do think that it, it's easier uh, to absorb facts if one can work with patterns. So the, the first thing I urge my students to do is when they're reading a book, uh, confronting an array of facts, is to begin not by reading but by studying the book. Study the architecture of the book. Study the, 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 the structure of it. Uh, uh, and then uh, that will give you a frame. Um, when you're working with facts themselves, uh, to look for uh, the larger patterns within which those facts fit. And I, I think a good part of teaching is about helping to make those patterns accessible. And, of course, they can be patterned in many different ways. 
But then the facts take on a meaning, uh, and it's the meaning that helps us to, to keep them in, in mind. That's, that's, what, that's what I would recommend. Do stories help keep Stories that? help a lot, and uh, stories that can bring uh, a fact to life uh, by uh, by uh, uh, reminding us of the people who were who were part of it. I, I think that's the key. Sacramento, hello. Oh, hello. Uh, so nice to. Uh, it's a real honor to and privilege to be able to talk with C-SPAN and especially Book TV. And, and my questions are uh, that I, I've have I notice in the advertising for this program uh, the, you would mention uh, Paul Revere's ride and you had mentioned Washington crossing the Delaware, and I'm really hoping that you'll cover some of the details <clears throat> and the significance of Paul Revere's ride and of Washington crossing the Delaware, because that's kind of like what your advertising implied that that would be covered in the program, at least that's the way I read it. And that's what you want? And that's the, and there's one more, oh, it's so nice, let me tell you, uh, to be on like this. And the other question I'd have, I noticed when President Carter talked about the Revolutionary War, he said they, wasn't, they didn't take any prisoners. But I've read other books, and I know that sometimes they did. And, and what's the situation as far as prisoners in the Revolutionary War? Well, let me uh, uh, try to, to, to make a, a, an answer to, to, uh, as to Washington's Crossing. Let me start with that. Uh, and uh, to say that that was a, a book um, that begins with a story we all know, uh, and then uh, I tried to uh, get into it in more, uh, de depth, uh, more depth. I found that this event, when people heard about Washington's Crossing, the effect was what um, psychologists call flashbulb memory. It's the memory we have of 9-11, uh, or of, uh, of uh, I'm just barely old enough to remember Pearl Harbor in those terms, and a flashbulb memory is a memory that illuminates the circumstances around an event. And that's what I found in the diaries and the memoirs of, of, of Washington's Crossing. And so I began to tell that story as a series of discoveries, a discovery about Washington, who very much surprised me, uh, in uh, the, uh, inventing a new style of leadership for these very difficult, cantankerous Yankees and backcountry riflemen and Pennsylvania associators who he was uh, who were in his army, I was surprised to discover that the British and the Hessians um, were very good at their jobs and believed deeply in what they were doing in this country. They had another way of thinking about the, about the about uh, 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 the, the revolution, uh, and it was a, con a conflict between two uh, causes. And then it tells the story as a set of choices in which a large number of people become involved. Washington and the people in his boats, uh, the people of New Jersey who rise against their captors and create an opportunity for Washington. And the other thing I discovered, didn't expect to find this, but that at the same time that Washington was inventing this new way of, of leading, along with others in the, in the army, and he was managing that campaign, he also worked out a way of connecting the American Revolution and its values to the conduct of the War of Independence. And one of them was about just what you asked, about prisoners. Uh, Washington, in, 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 at the, the low point of the revolution for him, which came in November of, of, of 1776, was on the Jersey Palisades, looking across the Hudson River, as a large part of his army was forced to surrender in Fort Washington, which was on the northern tip of Manhattan, and he saw them not only surrendering, but then there was something called the law of quarter in the 18th century, which allowed a captor to decide whether his prisoner would live or die. And some of the Hessians, uh, some of the British troops, decided to kill their American prisoners on the spot, which they did. And Washington watched this. And the, there's a description of him in tears of, of despair and frustration. Um, it, at the very nadir, the low point of the revolution. And then he led his army across, back across New Jersey, attacked at Trenton, took a lot of Hessian prisoners himself, and about 900 of them, and then many English prisoners at the Battle of Trenton, more than 500 there. And he issued orders, after talking with people in the Continental Congress, 
that these prisoners would be treated as having the same rights that the American Revolution was for, that they would have a right to life. And they were treated very carefully that way on orders that, from Washington that were accepted, I think, throughout his army. Uh, Mr. Carter has written a novel about a different part of the Revolution, which was in the American South, which became a very different sort of struggle uh, between families, between clans. It got uh, very uh, uh, violent and, and ugly. And there it's true that there were prisoners killed on both sides. But in, the, in the, most of the Revolution, the American leaders and many of the army uh, were in, imposing what they called a policy of humanity which they thought was not only the right thing to do, but the only way to win the war. And they won many people to their cause uh, by doing that. And that's what Washington's Crossing is about. Well, in the aftermath of, of Abu Ghraib, yes. you look at this in a historical standpoint. Were there periods in which the American people uh, saw a, um, a, a, another story, somewhat like Abu Ghraib, going on and were upset by yes, there, the Americans? Th yes, th uh, that did happen. and it. It happened in, in, in quite a number of wars. I think the, 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 most, uh, the most important example is My Lai in, in Vietnam. But it's important to remember about both, both Abu Ghraib and, and My Lai that it, it was, the, the, it was the, in, the, in the army itself that soldiers came forward and reported these things. And then uh, the army launched uh, investigations uh, and made every effort to, to, put a stop to, to put a stop to that. And so I, can, I think that the policy of humanity is still alive in the United States Army, uh, even when things go wrong, as they surely did. And caller, we promise you we'll get to some of the specifics about uh, the Paul Revere book uh, in our second half of our program, including a picture of Paul Revere I bet you've never seen. At least I had never seen it at 77 years old. Washington, D.C., you're our last caller for our first segment. Hello. Good day. Let's remember on this date. November 7, 2000, Albert Gore Jr. won the election. The Supreme Court Justice said America lost. I have a correction for you and an important question. Uh, you said about the ATM machines that they don't have mistakes. This is the improper system. We, we under law have a right to elections that are uncorruptible as Canada has. The correct machines are in Washington, D.C., an optical scanner, very simple machine, very cheap with a paper trail. No one knows who's won this election because there is no record. Now, my question, sir, it has to do with Aristotle's essay on slavery, why slavery should be. I consider that Aristotle's mistake, which coincides with Thomas Jefferson and George Washington's mistake uh, of being slave owners. And homage to Daniel Shays by Gore Vidal shows that the British required land ownership to vote after the American Revolution. <clears throat> Washington and Jefferson required twice as much land to vote. And that's why Daniel Shays went on. Hayek's mistake, and he says the sacred right of property, which is, is the laws of dominion from Rome, how ownership will go in John Lynch's letter, 1831. Now, very simply, one more, two more sentences. You know, as the sacred right of individual shows up in American history, with Zephaniah Swift, 1831. And I wonder if you're familiar with this, this property owners and the individual sacred right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'd like to hear your comments. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. I, 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 let me take it in, in take a parts of it one, one by one. First of all, as to voting, I think um, what you describe is what I see as well. I think we're moving toward the system that you that, that, that you've just described of a, of a touch screen with a, with a paper trail uh, that does work. And um, that, if we get that, I think that's the, uh, that's the way to, to put it right. It looks to be as if we're moving very much in, 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 that, in, in that direction. As to the other parts of your, of your question, I would say on the subject of slavery, yes, about Aristotle, and, uh, but I, I'm not sure I would, I, I think we don't quite agree on the American leaders in the revolution who um, did much more about slavery uh, than they've often been represented as, at least in some recent work. It's, I think it's important to remember that they did put, put, it, put an end, uh, to, they ended slavery in seven out of the 13 states. Uh, these were the first general emancipations in world history. 
Uh, they also uh, put an end to the African slave trade in 11 out of 13 states. They very nearly shut it down, except in South Carolina and Georgia. They excluded slavery from the Northwest Territories, which became uh, something of vital importance to the way American history uh, began. And I think that they did quite a lot about slavery, even if they failed to, to, to end it in, uh, in, in six, uh, in six uh, southern states. Even there, they came close in, in, in two of them. And I observe that people who criticize them in our own time uh, are not very mindful of the fact that slavery still exists in the world. And I ask the critics of the founders, what are you doing about slavery today? I have students who have refounded the American Anti-Slavery Society in Boston uh, to, um, to, to, to deal with slavery, which now exists in every country in the world, including our own. Uh, and when I give a course on slavery in early America, I get 100 students or more at Brandeis. I offered a course on slavery today, and I got one student. Americans are not uh, thinking about that, and it's worth keeping that in mind as a perspective on the, on the founders. Much more with David Hackett Fisher coming up. But as we said, mm -hmm. he has uh, for 85 semesters been teaching. And we're going to take you to Brandeis and show you a little bit of his interaction with his students and also give you an idea of some of uh, the people and the books that most influence him. The bus discussion was around the Japanese American internment, so I think that book. And the Daniels book, the Daniels yeah. book worked well. I think so. Yeah. yeah. What didn't work? Um, the Spectre. I mean, I, they, I mean, I don't think they've taken to that so much. And about the read, in conjunction with the readings, and what? Uh, let's just. We're going to go right over here. Uh, how I got started in history is a is a long story, and, and uh, grows out of my family. I think I was born and raised in Maryland, and uh, uh, many, uh, uh, it was, I'm a, a typical American mongrel uh, of the most common variety, part Anglo and uh, part Saxon. Uh, my, uh, my family were, were mostly German in, in, in Baltimore, and then on my mother's side, uh, some memory of old Maryland, and those were two different claims on a, on a young person, both made in historical terms. And then growing up in the midst of history, and on top of that, in World War II, and all of that came together. I think uh, that's a recipe for making a historian. Nickel talks about the legal maneuvering that goes on by Cherokee by Cherokee hired lawyers to say no, the tribe is in control here, um, and to follow the what, the American legal system. Um, it's a, so, it's sixty it's, pages long, so. Yeah. It's an interesting paradox there, in that the, the, these, it's a, 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 the, some of the Cherokees striving for their own sense of law, their own system of mm -hmm. law, and doing it within the framework of American law, of, of, uh, appealing for their rights in this process. There's interesting that Jill Norgren mm -hmm. uh, uh, suggested that this is a big story, a much longer story. It begins, she doesn't know how early. And I thought it was the same story we were talking about uh, with uh, the Ponca in Bright Eyes and Standing Bear, mm -hmm. where they were suing um, for their uh, tribal right. uh, rights and tribal ways within the district court in Nebraska, right, right. 1876. And so uh, the question, I wonder, when did this begin? Uh, uh, how far does it reach? It clearly reaches even to our own time. I was always interested in early American history. I, I was uh, drawn to origins, to the way things began. Uh, and then as I got uh, deeper into it, partly I was growing up in the midst of many sites that were early American, and, and that, that was another uh, bond uh, uh, as well. And, the, and the, as I got into it, I began to find uh, more and more that kept me there. Our problems about the Republic, about uh, what this country is, all about, and uh, that, uh, that was the beginning of a, of a, of a long, uh, of, a, of, a, of a long career.
uh, Liberty and Freedom book uh, started uh, with, a, with two uh, chance uh, discoveries. One of them was uh, uh, a search through the dictionaries on, on those words, and uh, liberty was what I thought it would have been in its origins. It's a, a Latin and a, and a Greek uh, root that, that means separate, independent, autonomous, and that way unlike a slave. Then I was amazed to, to look up freedom and discover that it has the same root uh, as the word friend. It's, a, it's an Indo-European word that means beloved. And I thought that's an odd uh, con beginning for, for freedom. And then suddenly it dawned on me that freedom meant uh, the condition of uh, living with uh, others, uh, being connected to other free people by bonds of affection or kinship and in that way unlike a slave. So liberty and freedom are the same as being unlike a slave, but they're the opposite in that liberty means separation, freedom means connection. Uh, and we English speakers are the only people who get to have both liberty and freedom, and it's been like a coiled spring in our culture. So the work I do is about these two ideas of liberty and freedom, like the DNA in American culture, combined in many different forms. Uh, through the past 16 generations. We're back live with David Hackett Fisher on In-Depth for this month. How, what kind of grade would you give current historians? I think there are a lot of really good work is being done uh, in, in, by historians. The first thing to know, know about academic historians is that they are as diverse as, as any other group. It would be like gen generalizing about politicians or or journalists, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just amazed by the quality of of, of the books that are are coming. Uh, you uh, actually uh, asked to bring a couple with I, you. I you did. Want to grab I, them. Um, and we'll I, show I, our uh, viewers. Two that are just uh, these. These are these just have been published this year, and um, one of them is by Brian Donahue, uh, who is uh, at who is an environmental historian. Uh, he actually is one of my colleagues at, at Brandeis. The book has just been published by the Yale Press, and he's. Th th what's interesting about these books? They f they find new ways of of, write, of, of, of studying history and, and, and writing it. He uh, Brian is a farmer. He's a forester. He lives on the land, and he writes about environmental history. He reconstructed the history of Concord. He was part of that Concord project that I mentioned before. And uh, he reconstructed the environmental history of Concord from land deeds, which are incredibly difficult to do, and then put them into a computer so he can generate wonderful maps, if you can flip through sure. and show some of the maps that he did of land holdings, the way people use their land, and what came from all of that uh, was a discovery that I think is turning some environmental of uh, the environmental history historiography upside down in early America. He uh, discovered that these Concord farmers made that system work for about six generations. And the, 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 uh, the history that's been written before is mainly of degradation, environmental destruction. But here was sustainable use in a way that we had forgotten. And uh, it's, it's, it's a model um, for, for what we're doing uh, today. And, it comes out of not only the new work that Brian did in the archives, but his experience of the land. He also teaches in the same way. He takes his students on the land. And it's wonderful to see that working. And what's the other book? The other have? book is by Richard Cullen Rath. And it's um, about um, a, a sound in early America. Uh, uh, he, has, uh, he also is, brings his own experience to to this work. I always try with my students to get them working at the intersection of their interests and experiences and historical problems. And he's a musician, a uh, very good one, and uh, he, um, um, he's written a, a book of not only about how early America sounded, the soundscape, but also how people thought about sound. He finds, for example, that they thought of thunder as driving the lightning. Thunder had a kind of power, noise had a power. Uh, in their thinking in a way that doesn't, that we, we, don't, we don't have today. And then he develops this in, in the most extraordinary uh, the reconstruction 
of both a world and a, and a way of thinking about it. Now, I've uh, seen over the past several years other books somewhat like this, but, you know, the, uh, the history of New England through the look of the cod, through the codfish was one of them. Yes. There's a new one out on the history of the bicycle, but actually it's a history of transportation mm -hmm. in America. There's even a new one out about the history of the cow. Yes, uh, it, uh, many, a uh, many imaginative uh, approaches, and others that uh, there's a huge new book out by Michael McCormick. Uh, 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 he's a medieval historian on the origins of the European uh, economy. It sounds very uh, dry. It's mainly about the eighth and ninth centuries, and what he did was to uh, invent a way of reconstructing the economy of Europe in the Dark Ages, which were very dark for historians, and he does it with uh, underwater archaeology of uh, ships with coin finds and, and, uh, and, and coin evidence, with the records of travelers who were not on economic, or not on commercial voyages, but uh, uh, reconstructing the, the network there. And it's just an amazing achievement. He's, uh, all of these three works have invented new ways of, of, of studying history and have produced a uh, new result. This goes on very quietly. These books are not on the bestseller list. Uh, but they are a major contribution, and that's the work that never gets in the headlines. And How has yours or their work changed since before the technological a, changes? A, a revolution in our own time. The, 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 uh, the digital uh, revolution has changed the way uh, a, a scholar works with these sources. Uh, now the, the searchable um, uh, texts, electronic texts, entire newspapers are searchable in a way that they never were before. That's a, that's a revolution. Uh, it changes the relationship between a writer and his own text in that uh, we can make experiments with a word processor that we could never do uh, before. Now some uh, historians are worried on the other side of it that correspondence, which has been such a place for to gather the uh, information for for books like this is gone because it's gone in an email. Well, we are discovering the archives of email records. Uh, it turns out, as some people have found to their distress, that it's very difficult to destroy an electronic uh, transmission. And uh, historians are beginning to tap into that uh, to that material. So you that don't material. think it's going to cause a problem? I, I think the problem is going to be that we're going to be overwhelmed with emails. I, 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 it's it, I, it's going to be an embarrassment of. Uh, of, 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 of materials. But another thing it has done is what's happening here now. It also changes the relationship between an author and his, and his readers so that uh, now I hear from a lot more people uh, on, uh, you know, on, the, on, uh, on the internet and uh, I can answer them very quickly uh, in a way that was not possible uh, uh, before. So uh, then it's interesting to see how huge archives are being worked out. I was just at Yale last week and talking with graduate students who are putting together a new Yale Indian Papers project, which is really quite remarkable. They're gathering things all over the state of Connecticut, and they're also making them very much ex more accessible than they've ever been before. And one can multiply that by many, many um, um, hundreds of, 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 of uh, of projects. Next is Martin Tennessee. Hello. Martin Tennessee, please go ahead. My question for Dr. Fisher is would you care to speak to the concept of the majority rules? What would you like him to say, caller? Or what would you like question would you like to go into? Well that's what I was afraid was gonna happen. I'm a little <laughs> fuzzy on it myself. Uh, you mean how we got to how it? How does that relate to, uh, uh, say, the computers? If we could all vote on whether to raise taxes or mm. lower them. Well, let me take a let me let me have a go at that. I, I it, it's a very large question, and I thought at first you were asking me about the history of of majority rule, but I think you are asking about majority rule in our own time and uh, uh, our. Um, uh, are uh, these, uh, the, the, the new technological uh, changes uh, making it um, more difficult to happen? I, I tend to be um, an optimistic fatalist about these things. I think that, uh, that in fact, uh, the Internet uh, and, uh, and other changes are making majority rule more uh, uh, effective, um, making um, 
the, the connections between uh, people and their representatives closer uh, than probably they've ever been uh, before. So I see, see this not as an instrument of control or manipulation, that is to say, the, the web, the internet, not that, but rather uh, as a, a new uh, democratizing uh, 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 agent. Uh, and I think that's the way we're heading. Fort Bragg. Uh, sir, I wonder if you could comment on Howard Zinn's History of the United States, what your feeling is about that book. Thank you very much. Uh, Howard Zinn is a friend of mine, lives near, nearby in Massachusetts, and uh, he's a wonderful fellow. We, uh, we meet occasionally, and um, I think I could say we have what um, diplomats would call an exchange of views on American history. I think his book is, is terrific. It's a... It's, but it's not the way I think about American history. It's, it's history from the bottom up. Uh, and in that way, it's very well done. Uh, it's a corrective to uh, the old history from the top down. But I don't know that it has to be top down or bottom up. I think there's another possibility, which to me in the center is that uh, history can include those elements, but also deal with the missing majority in America, the great bulk of people who are in the center and uh and 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 and, and i sh should be i think central to this to this story at a time in which uh, many people are talking about um, religious background and religious influences on politics this uh, person david moore from austin says that he and his wife have read your book historical fallacies where you talk about metaphysical fallacy his question is this would you please describe your own religious background if any and how that influences your scholarship I um, have a very mixed Protestant background. I was uh, catechized as a Presbyterian, um, I think mainly because I was growing up in a very large extended family, and my uncle's brother was the minister in the Presbyterian church, and I, it was, he had gone to Edinburgh and was a very old-fashioned Calvinist. I think we even got some, some of the five points. Uh, uh, in that experience. But then I was um, confirmed in a Lutheran church uh, where my parents had been in the first English Lutheran church in Baltimore. I'm still a member of that, of that, of that church. And um, I, I married a Methodist and we encouraged our children to find their own way. Uh, one of my uh, children became an Episcopalian. Uh, the other uh, became a Unitarian is now uh, growing more interested in, in, in Buddhism. After all this, I uh, live in a Catholic community and teach in a University of Jewish sponsorship. So it's a, it's a story of American diversity. Uh, I think my uh, religious upbringing is a very important part of what I do. I still use my Confirmation Bible frequently. It sits beside me as I, as I work. But I'm very uncomfortable with people who wear their faith on their sleeves and i'm still more uncomfortable with people who would link politics and religion in the way that uh, some are doing i remember ernest hemingway uh, writing in one of his letters he said i wouldn't use these these words myself but he said he said to hell with a church when it becomes a state and to hell with a state when it becomes a church that's what he thinks and i uh, that would not be my language but I think that's another faith-based way that has deep roots in Protestantism. And it's my way of thinking about religion in this republic. In Washington's Crossing, this emailer asked the question, you mentioned two or three times a Hessian officer named Frederick Fisher. Was he an ancestor? He was not an ancestor. My wife actually has a collateral ancestor who was a, a Hessian, not at the battles of Trenton or or Princeton, but it's amazing to me to see how many Americans do have Hessian ancestors, and uh, there's a wonderful organization called the Johannes Schwalm Historical Society, uh, which has uh, made available a lot of Hessian records, very useful in anybody who works with that material, and it's mostly American descendants of, of Hessian soldiers. About a, a third of them stayed in America. Gallup, New Mexico. Hi, I thank you for the show. It's so interesting. I love history. And earlier, if unless I misheard you, you said that 
you would like to see more discourse between academia and government or people that rule. And I was thinking, how is that going to be possible when the words elite, intellectual, liberal, um, those words are almost used as cuss words now. So I was wondering how you're going to be able to bridge the gap between the academia and the government. Thank you. I, I think uh, when I speak of discourse, um, I had something special in mind. I, I, everybody's talking these days, but nobody's listening. And what I would like to see would be a, a, a process of listening on both sides. Uh, I, I also think that uh, what I'm trying to do in all of my books is to um, reinforce the center in American life. Uh, my books are meant to speak to that in, 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 various, in various ways. And that's what one teacher uh, uh, can, can do. I think all of us uh, can do more, maybe most of all, by listening. Portland, Oregon. Yes, I was with the St. Nicholas Society and put you up for our Washington Irving Award. Uh, and I wonder, uh, given the fine historiography and the range of which we've seen here between social history and historiography that you've shown, what you think of the red and blue state divisions, given the uh, tremendous emphasis that you make on the four folkways of America and Albion Seed, do you think the growing Hispanic section will change that four folkways, or will they, will they be integrated into the folkways you already observed? Thanks for that question, and, and, and thanks for the St. Nicholas uh, Award. I uh, uh, much appreciate that. And we were just in, in, in Portland uh, last week uh, uh, speaking uh, at, the, at the Historical Society. Uh, as to your question, I think, yes, I, I do see the persistence of these folkways, and I wonder uh, about um, the, uh, the new immigration and um, the, the, the flow of culture. I, I think there are areas in America where we are seeing a, a new uh, folk regions, new cultural regions. I think perhaps the, the southern part of, of Texas uh, and, 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 and other places which stand out on those electoral maps very clearly. That's the part of Texas that voted uh, for Mr. Kerry. Uh, and. Um, uh, 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 we may we'll see some Hispanic um, uh, regions that have this an integrity as complete as as the as the regions I was talking about. In other parts of America, I see Hispanic um, immigrants moving into my town and others, and learning to um, play by New England rules. Uh, they become a part of that town process. They begin to talk uh, with a New England accent and say, "Pack your car." Uh, in the way that Yankees have, have done for 16 generations. So I expect we're going to see both of those tendencies. That would be my, uh, my, my, my prediction. Speaking of awards, we should tell you that uh, as we are doing this program in the early part of November of 2004, this book is up for the National Book Award. Were you surprised? I was amazed uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and very honored to, to be there in company of, of many uh, 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 extraordinary uh, books and, uh, and, and authors. Including uh, the 9-11 Commission including report. Including by, by my classmate uh, Tom Keene from, from Princeton, yes. But this will be and, uh, uh, awarded later in the month of uh, November 2004. And is this your first nomination for the first, National Book first Award? First nomination for a, a book. It's very nice to be a, a finalist. Uh, Palm City, Florida. Hello, Dr. Fisher. I was a uh, studied under Edward Penozian and Dr. Paul Cool and ended up as a fundamentalist Baptist preacher yes. at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in the mid-80s under Robert Calhoun and, and uh, honed my Calvinism there under studying him. Historians' fallacies fell into my hand, and it was a godsend to me. <clears throat> of course, it's not the only one of your books that I have, and this is about like accolades and kudos to you. I want other people to learn of your books who may not be familiar with them. Of course, the offshoot from historians' fallacies, evangelical fallacies, I'm sure you're aware of that. It's not nearly as good a book as yours. But uh, all of this path on which I've been led has led me into uh, a Congregationalist church, which I pastor here. And I see your list of great Americans, John Winthrop, William Penn, Abraham Lincoln, I agree with that list. But I wonder where you place Jonathan Edwards as a thinker and rank him in influence as an American. 
I, I would place him at the top of American theologians and, uh, and, a, and one of the most interesting minds that I've ever met in my, in, in my uh, reading. A very interesting, uh, doubly so, I think, uh, both for, uh, for his uh, and for the way he linked it to uh, intellectual currents in his own time. Some people have set him down as an anachronism in the 18th century. I don't see that at, at all. Uh, I see him as working with Locke, with Newton, and building a new, a, a new, uh, and very creative uh, uh, synthesis. I think he would be high on a, on on a on a list, uh, though maybe not uh, have, with the same reach as those people that I put uh, uh, at the at the top. Rapid City, South Dakota. Yes. Hello. Hello. You're on the air, ma'am. Okay, hello. I'm very, very thankful for Suzanne. It's just so wonderful. And I'm really, um, I'm just almost speechless in hearing of Dr. Fisher because I am probably around the same age and I was very much influenced by the World, World War II, which I was only about, I was born in 41. But still, at that very young age, I was feeling it and understood something about history. And my real question is i'm trying through being so interested so very young and reading so many books as a child mm -hmm. only to find that everyone was writing something different i was not getting the true picture and i never knew what really to believe and that was always the very you know that kind of put me off but yet i still keep striving and i started out with uh, early American history, then I went on to British history, and I've, my biggest interest is Russian history, because I've never been able to understand why so many people could go along and follow in the Stalinist Marxist way, and why, you know, and I've just read a book that was given to me as a gift a few years ago, and it's a very inexpensive book, and I hope you don't mind my letting you know this, but, um, it was very poorly written, very terrible, very difficult to read. But I learned very much in it about how the main purpose um, that was so destructive was that they took the humanism out of the way they looked at their socialism. It's like human beings did not really count. Is that true in, in okay. what you have found? Yes. Well, thank you very much for that question. I think you and I... Uh, agree on, 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 on many things, but perhaps uh, partly because we are of about the same age. I was uh, uh, about six years old, uh, I was six years old uh, when, when, when Pearl, uh, Pearl, but just before Pearl Harbor, uh, and the, the, the Second World War was uh, the, the, the shaped much of my growing up. Uh, my family, like most families, uh, was caught up in, in that war, and uh, my uncles and, and cousins were everywhere. Uh, uh, that uh, in, in the in, in the campaigns that followed, uh, and we had a sense of intimate connection with what was happening. That what some of the, the great um, the, the the great and central concerns of of my youth were connected to a, a a big historical event. And I find that people who are the same age as as, as you and 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 I am uh, share that interest in history because it was so much a part of the world we grew up in. As to the second part of your question, uh, I think you and I also share a, a, that, that uh, idea of history as inquiry. And I also uh, look into, uh, in, into things wondering, as you have been wondering, in, in amazement at some of the things that I, that I find, opposing the same sorts of questions. Uh, and, um, and, and, and finding answers which then, as we said before, become questions in their turn. And, but uh, just in taking her point uh, you know, a step further, the, the fact that she had an almost unreadable script, yes. uh, a book to read, do you think that's going to become a thing of the past? I mean, are, are Americans or uh, readers demanding more history that is 
the type of history that you re that you wrote in the Paul Revere book in Washington's Crossing? I suppose it might it, it'll probably always be a problem as long as textbooks are written by committees. Mm -hmm. I think we may have we may have a problem. There, Do you consider but, uh, it a dumbing down? Well, I think history? sometimes it has been. I, 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 but there is so much good writing that's going on that's happening uh, today. It, uh, I, I take great delight in the work of David McCullough, for example, who has been reaching so many uh, Americans. A, a great scholar. He, he and I see things differently, but we in some ways, but uh, but we share a common passion. We share materials. With one another, what and do you it's mean, a, share materials? well, he um, um, uh, uh, told me about uh, a very important manuscript uh, collection that I had missed, and just in the nick of time, I sent him my list of sources. And he's working on a book on the year 1776 now, which will touch some of the same themes. And uh, is, that, is I, there it, that kind of give and take between historians normally? I think uh, it, there's more of that than than one would think, uh, and. Um, when I brought out my, my uh, book on the, the Federalists, the, the, my first book, uh, I ran into some criticism from a man named Ron Formazano, who did his dissertation on the Jacksonians, and he thought that was the pivot point in American history. So we had exchanges of views, and then we founded a seminar together at the American Antiquarian Society, and have become good friends and, and teach, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and yet are never of one mind. And I think that's a, the way Ron has came to this controversy is a model of what I would hope would, uh, could happen. Donald Yergsa uh, of Eastern Nazarene College wrote an article uh, and an interview with you about three years ago uh, in a historical uh, uh, publication calling you hopelessly, rec hopelessly restless. Yes. Uh, Tremendously uh, gifted but hopelessly uh, jumping restless. Jumping from one a project Yes. to one book to another, yeah. and maybe there's some truth to, to this. But then he went on in the next sentence to say there was a pattern. The, in, the, he did say the, that there was a pattern. Yes. Do you, and, uh, but do you jump around on purpose? Is there, no, it's, is it's, there? Uh, it, there's a, there is a, a, a sequence there. It's more of a story than, than an analysis, but it started with the political history, and then from a sense of problems there, I got into the historiography, which was the fallacies book. Many people were doing that at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then into the new social history, a sense of the limits there and into the cultural history. Then a sense that we weren't getting the stories out. And so into a Paul Revere and Washington's crossing. And so there's a kind of logic to that. Poquito, of, excuse me, Poquito Bayou, Florida. Yes, hi. Uh, hi. It uh, seems to me that the great in-between or the great middle is uh, pretty much defined by natural law or uh, human nature. And, of course, our founders were students of human nature, and that's why they designed the government the way they did, uh, including a federal republic. And I hope that that stays around for a long time. But uh, the point of my call is here in Florida we have Celebrate Freedom Week, which concentrates on... 1776, or at least the uh, Declaration of Independence, and uh, it requires the students to recite, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and so forth. Uh, how can we, in Florida, bring home tangibly the ideas behind our revolution that were defined, set forth in that great moral document, the Declaration of Independence? And I was looking particularly at your liberty and freedom, thinking about buying it uh, for that particular purpose, to make those uh, abstract ideas more tangible to our students. That's, exact, that's exactly what I was trying to do in, in Liberty and in, in Freedom, was to uh, represent uh, those two ideas in the symbols and the objects that, that represented them. And uh, we've just organized an exhibition, we, uh, myself, uh, uh, working with uh, some very able uh, uh, people at the Virginia Historical Society, James Kelly, um, uh, Jeffrey Ruggles, uh, Charles Bryan, and uh, it's uh, it's an exhibition on liberty and freedom that will uh, that will travel uh, to six uh, museums. We don't have a a, a venue in in Florida uh, at the moment, uh, but I wonder if something might be up, uh, could possibly. Uh, be done th that way. But I observe that, uh, that people respond to artifacts, 
to images. Uh, the young people today are visually much more alert and intelligent than I ever was. Uh, they can process images in a microsecond. And um, that's an opportunity for us. And I think um, we, are, we should make the most of it. We have an address that we can put on your screen where people can reach you through your publisher if they would like they to. They can do that, or we could put my email address as well. We can. It, it's just <laughs> fisher at brandeis.edu, and uh, I'd be happy Good luck. to hear from, to hear <laughs> from you may people. Be a, you uh, may get a lot of people. Fisher at brandeis.edu. Yes. Well, we promised the uh, viewer earlier that we would talk a little bit more in depth about the Paul Revere book. And yes. I wanted to start with this portrait when Paul Revere was 77 years old. I, yes. I had never seen this before. Maybe and his I'm, wife as well. On his the, wife is on, on the, the opposite, opposite uh -huh. On the opposite uh, uh, page. And uh, I guess I always thought of Paul Revere as a young writer. Yes. But he never uh, aged. That's the, that's the image that I, I had as well. And then to discover that he was part of two revolutions, the American Revolution and then the Industrial Revolution, and he founded what would later become the Revere Copper and Brass Company and uh, had, a, had a major impact uh, that way. And you, you wrote at the, at the, in the um, early part of this that you found out that no one had written about Paul Revere for almost two centuries? No, no I, I, I wouldn't. I, I, I don't think I can go quite that uh, far, but that uh, no historian had written a uh, history of, of, of the ride. Of the ride itself. Uh, of the ride itself in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sustained way. So uh, there had been a lot of good writing about mm -hmm. Paul Revere. Esther Forbes wrote a wonderful book about Paul Revere, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1942. It's about his domestic life, and it, it's beautifully done. So how, so how did your equestrian uh, prowess help you as you well, wrote uh, this Well, to book? give one ex example, uh, uh, Paul Revere was, um, had mounted his horse, uh, Brown Beauty, and was riding from Charlestown, uh, hopefully toward Lexington, was where he wanted to, 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 to go it. And um, he describes in his account, he has three accounts of, of this that, we, that tell us that his mood. He said it was a... It was a beautiful night, it was clear, and he was mounted on a, on a very good horse. And uh, he uh, kicked the horse into a canter, and, uh, and, uh, you, can, and he, he, you could see that he was um, just savoring that, that experience. And then suddenly, there were British patrols out, and two British officers appeared ahead of him. Their mission was to interrupt people like Paul Revere, and uh, he didn't, he missed them. He was so caught up in the moment. I think it was the horse who noticed first. Uh, and suddenly Paul Revere realized his danger and uh, pulled the horse around, uh, 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 spurred him into a gallop and, and, and escaped. But I, uh, I suddenly, I, in the process of riding, I discovered what a wonderful thing it is to canter a horse. And it's the gait in which horse and, and rider become nearly one. You're nodding. You grew up no, on a farm, so you, uh, you know about that. <laughs> and uh, and um, I, I, uh, I, I couldn't, I, I could feel what had happened to Paul Revere because it happened to me on the back of a, on the back of a horse. And only riding could, could, uh, could produce that, that, that sense of, of, of understanding. What did you find in writing this book that you had not, that you learned, that you didn't know before, or that hadn't been written about much? Well, uh, the, the, the one thing was, was how the revolution worked. Uh, it w was, had been centered on uh, small groups uh, manipulated from the top down, and then we began to get some of the bottom-up work that's been going on. But what I found I, in the back of the book, uh, a list of or revolutionary organizations in Boston. I first discovered how very complicated the, the, the revolutionary movement was, how many groups in this small town of 15,000 people were, were part of it. And I did a, 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 an appendix on the members in that, in that uh, a group, uh, in those groups, and I discovered that nobody belonged to all of them. Most people only belonged to one or two. And there were two men who belonged to most, nearly all. One of them was Dr. Joseph Warren, and one of them was Paul Revere. And uh, that, uh, that taught me about the, number one, the opening, the, 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 the permeability of that process, and also about the role of, of, of Paul Revere. I also discovered that the night that he was out riding, we found 60 other riders who were out 
as well. We're up to 80 now. We mapped them. There is a map in the book that shows all of those riders, and they took their point of departure from Paul Revere. And that told me that there were some people who functioned as communicators, as the, link, the people who linked the, uh, the, all those various groups. And that was his function. And that was one, one conclusion, I think, that has a reach of for the revolution. We need to get back to our phones, but I want to ask you, I, I noticed in here that you have actual conversations in quotes. Is that, <clears throat> are these conversations made up as a, as from knowing it, or where did you find out that these actual words were used? Which, uh, which conversations? Well, I guess I'm just uh, looking uh, at, um, gentlemen, uh, Revere told them you miss, you, you've missed of your aim, what yes. of your aim? Yes, like right. That, that's a wonderful, uh, Exchange that was when Paul Revere was captured by uh, mm -hmm. by by yet another British uh, patrol. They were very angry men. They were they could hear the musket uh, the muskets going off around them. The, these were uh, these were warning shots uh, to alarm the countryside. And uh, there was a very excitable British officer who I uh, searched Paul Revere for weapons. I was ready to to to, to kill him. I think. And then another British officer rode up and, and said to Paul Revere, may I crave your name, sir? How do we know those records? They co actually come from Paul Revere's own account, uh, and they're direct quotes. All of these things are direct quotes. None of them are made up. And um, it, I thought that was a very odd phrase. May I crave your name, sir? Even by 18th century um, uh, uh, standards. And I was giving, I was talking, I was invited to the meeting of the Masonic Lodge in Boston, where Paul Revere was a member. And afterwards, uh, that in another lodge meeting, uh, one of the Masons came up. I'm not a Mason, but he came up and he said, um, I think that phrase was a Masonic password. Uh, and um, uh, I, then he suddenly clammed up. And uh, I raised the, the, the issue at, th at that table meeting. And there was dead silence around the table. And then one of the Masons said, well, we could tell you, but then we'll have to kill you. <laughs> so I, uh, I abandoned that line of inquiry. But I think that that exchange was one in which there were Masons on both sides of the American Revolution. And the fraternity that they shared, the, the sense of brotherhood, may have kept Paul Revere alive that night, quite, quite possible. Castro Valley, California. You're on with David Hackett Fisher. Hello, it's such a pleasure to talk with you, and I really want to thank C-SPAN for all of the wonderful programming that you put on, especially the programs with the three-hour in-depth. Um, and I'd like to ask, um, given the um, European states, you know, the United States of Europe and their uh, focus on having a great welfare state with high sales tax and health care for all, and child care for moms when they stay at home for the first year to take care of their children with a guaranteed job return when they go back to work after a year, uh, and no major money spent on military spending. Uh, it seems that America is moving away from higher taxation and um, avoiding dealing with national health care, but we're sending people all over the world, you know, and being the policemen of the world. Uh, what do you think... Um, yeah, or is there a meeting ground on addressing these differences? And it seems like our cultures have come from a lot of Europe. You know, our, um, the, you know, our generations in the past came from Europe. Um, and do you see a role for America to play worldwide in this regard? And that's, uh, I know, but I hope I have uh, explained it. Uh, but that's Thanks, California. Thank, thank you for your question. Uh, I, I would tend to think that those differences are going to or will continue as, 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 as far as we can see or even think about the, about the, the, the future. But I would hope that they could, um, that we could work uh, together with people in different cultures who will organize their open societies in ways that are, in some respects, unlike our, our own. As to our, our role in the world, I think there's some reason for hope there, particularly if we would look at Afghanistan where uh, we do have a, a coalition that's very effective. French troops on the ground uh, working with uh, uh, American troops despite the pyrotechnics in the press and uh, in our public uh, uh, discourse. Uh, so I, I think that um, Iraq may, I hope that Iraq will, uh, the troubles we've had there will not be the model that Afghanistan is, uh, suggests that we don't have to be the world's uh, policemen, but we could help to organize 
the process in a way that we that that would in, in, engage others as well. Timber Pines, Florida. Uh, yes, Dr. Fisher, I wanted to ask you specifically uh, about the questions that you're receiving on air now. Um, do you think that any way possibly that they're influenced by radical history by Howard Zinn and that historians are playing more of an, uh, trying to play a role more into applying history from past into future or present situations? And I guess the second question that I wanted to pose to you is also, have you noticed anything in your students within new trends in writing of history? You mentioned the new social uh, left history and things to that effect. Have you noticed any new trends at all? Yes, uh, as to the new trends, uh, I have very much so. I, I, uh, as I, I'm now e beginning to teach the grandchildren of, of, of students that I taught at the beginning of, of my uh, career. One thing, I teach a little course called Big Books. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the books in American history that uh, I that uh, are I think that uh, are, are most are especially interesting. One of them is Thoreau's Walden, and I take it's only a class of twelve or fifteen students, and we go out to Walden for and and talk about it on the banks of the on the on the edge of the pond where that uh, cabin had had stood. And when I started, uh, the the, the uh, young people who were um, interested in, 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 in Thoreau as a, uh, as a writer. And then in the 60s, they were into, into Thoreau as a, as a radical. In the 70s and 80s, they began to, to argue, as we were sitting there, that, that he was irresponsible, uh, socially irresponsible, uh, and uh, judged him by yet other standards. And today, the students are taking yet another way into, into, into Thoreau. They see him with a kind of complexity. That I'd never uh, that I've never uh, noted before. There's a process of, of maturity in their in their thought, which which surprises me, and uh, I take great comfort in that. I, I but it's a it's a it's a world. It's a, every, every group, every class is a different different chemistry. Next is Bristol, Virginia. Uh, yes, uh, our country doesn't seem to be a nation in the classical sense, and as much as we don't have a common culture or a common experience from, for the people. And uh, I just ask you if, if you think that maybe our government should engage our population by having a national draft or a national service, which would give our population that common experience. I, I think uh, it's a very interesting question about, about, uh, about nations in general. Uh, it's interesting to me that, uh, that a good many nations around the world don't share a a single culture. Switzerland uh, would be one. Belgium for another. Canada for a third. And I should think we are the most uh, diverse of, of, uh, of, of nations. Uh, and yet I do think we do share things. I, I, uh, we all share some idea of liberty and freedom. I, I, I think we, we have a set of values that way uh, that, are, uh, that do, uh, do hold us, uh, uh, do, do make us uh, one as to national service, um, um, one of my uh, students at Brandeis, uh, Eli Siegel, was the head of AmeriCorps, uh, and took uh, great uh, pride in that. And he won over many Republicans on Capitol Hill uh, to to support AmeriCorps when they had first been 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 uh, very skeptical about it. I I would favor some sort of national program i i uh, maybe perhaps it doesn't have to be introduced as a uh, as as a, a fixed requirement we don't have to conscript young people into it but i think we could enlarge those possibilities uh, perhaps between um, high school and, and college would would be a good time and they could serve uh, in the military they could serve uh, in other ways we could encourage that without coercing it and I think that might be worth a try. Aberdeen, Washington. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, um, uh, the historian that you have on. I can't think of his name. I just had a mental. <laughs> David mind. Hackett Fisher. David Hackett, yes. I, I enjoyed uh, uh, Washington's Crossing very much, especially the part about... Uh, uh, how Washington dealt with the ha Hessians. Yes. And, and um, you know, some year, about six years ago, 
I picked up a book titled Christianity, and in it, it asserted that um, the early Americans, the majority of early Americans were not Christians. Now, I'm 75 years old, and this contradicts what I was taught in school, and I wonder if you could uh, enlighten me uh, as to wh which as to whether some uh, people are trying to rewrite our history, vis the history or our atheism. Thanks, Aberdeen. Uh, yeah, I, th I don't know that book. It's certainly the case that nearly all European uh, migrants uh, to er early America, nearly all, but not all, uh, were, uh, were Christian. Uh, there was a, a, a Jewish, there were Jewish uh, communities that took root uh, in uh, Newport, uh, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Savannah, Charleston. Uh, other than those groups, I think uh, nearly all Americans uh, were Christian of many uh, nearly, I should say, nearly all Americans of European descent were Christians of many, many denominations. Uh, at the same time, uh, Africans, Indians, uh, brought other uh, ways, uh, other religions uh, into this uh, into this mix. So we've always been Christian, but some of us have been other things. And uh, I think that's a continuing pattern in American history. I'm not sure I can get this question right, but a colleague of mine was reading, Washington, was uh, listening to Washington's Crossing on tape. And he said, when you got to the part about just talking about what the colonies were going through as the, revolutionary, as the revolution was going on, he said, I couldn't help but think about Iraq. Yes. Is, is there? Co yes. I mean, some have made a connection about Well, that. I think we've been through a series of great crises, uh, the revolution, as one, not the first. Every generation before the revolution, and there were six of them, had uh, lived through a major war, uh, and then many uh, since. And I think the similarities between the, the uh, American Revolution and, uh, and Iraq are uh, those that rise from an open society that is severely tested by its, its enemies. Uh, as and we've had four of these tests in the 20th century alone, uh, uh, beginning with World War I, World War II, the Cold War, and now this. And we have a tradition for, uh, in the way that we respond to these crises. We don't remember the whole story, but in 9-11, in, in Americans remembered Pearl Harbor. Many of them spoke of that. Mm -hmm. uh, on Pearl Harbor Day, Americans remembered the crises that had preceded it. And so we've got a memory in America that works differently from European memories. It's about, it's a long chain with little links, but it's a very strong chain. And uh, we can see it uh, still in place. Brookstown, New Jersey. Hello. Hi, you're on the air, sir. Uh, my question is uh, re regarding the uh, influence of our philosophies. Uh, on our democracy. Of, of what? Example, the, the uh, sorry, of what philosophers? Uh, in, uh, color, in I, I'm sorry. Oh, of of what other philosophies, or did you say communist philosophies? Uh, in particular, the communist philosophy. Communist. And how, it, how did it shape the left wing of uh, of, of our democracy? Thank you. Uh, in in America, I think that uh, that. Um, the, that uh, uh, Marx and uh, uh, Marx in particular uh, had um, some impact in the in the 19 uh, uh, t early part of the 20th century, again in the 1930s, uh, and perhaps once more in the 1980s. Uh, there were three periods when uh, Americans uh, have called themselves uh, Marxists, uh, some Americans, but these were very very small numbers and. It was a, a, a minority within a minority, that is to say, a small group within the left. Most on the American left were not, uh, were not Marxist. I observed something in the universities, a tendency for some of my younger colleagues in the 1980s uh, to, be, to begin to call themselves uh, American Marxist, neo-Marxist historians. Uh, and they were very unlucky in their historical timing. They did it just before the fall of the Soviet Union and before the collapse of, of, of Marxist uh, regimes in many other uh, countries. And uh, now I think uh, people on the left are struggling to find um, other models, other ways of 
thinking. And um, one of my colleagues on the left, Eric Foner, who also shares my interest in freedom, has written a wonderful book called The Story of American Freedom, argues uh, to the left that they should think more about liberty and freedom, not let others in America take those ideas uh, for, their, for themselves. And I see in Eric's work a determination on the left to find another and more American way of thinking about uh, a left a politics of, of the left, which I think is very uh, constructive, even though I am more in the center and don't, don't, don't share it. Uh, Billings, Montana. Yes, Dr. Fisher, in Albion Seed, you traced the seeds of American liberty from the four British groups. Yes. How much do you think Native Americans have contributed to our notions of liberty and freedom and writing of the Constitution? And should teachers continue to teach about that contribution or not teach about the contributions, for instance, of the Puritans, which multicultural educators are recommending. I think that the, the Indian, that Indians uh, have had a major impact in one way, but not so much in another. I don't believe that the Iroquois Confederacy was a major model uh, for the American Constitution. I, I, I think the claims to that effect have been grossly exaggerated. Uh, there were uh, occasional expressions of interest that way, but they were made along with other and perhaps more numerous references to the Amphictyonic League in ancient Greece and various um, and, and a great many uh, models. So I would I, I'm not I, I'm not convinced uh, by that. But then in other ways, I think Indians made a profound contribution. Uh, American Indians themselves became symbols of of liberty and freedom, and I tell that story in. In, in, in my book. And then something very interesting happened in the late 19th century when three groups, and one of them were Indians, the others were former slaves in the South, and the third were uh, new immigrants from Southern Europe coming into Ellis Island uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. All three of these groups expanded ideas of liberty and freedom and an open society to be much more inclusive, much more universal than they'd ever been before. I talk a lot in my Liberty and Freedom book about a, a, a court case involving the Ponca Indians, in, in particular uh, a, a, a chief, a standing bear, who were um, uh, ordered uh, to uh, move from Nebraska uh, to Oklahoma. And uh, they were very nearly uh, destroyed uh, in, in, in Indian territory. They found their way back didn't take up arms as others had done before them, but they sued in U.S. District Court uh, for uh, their rights um, under the 14th Amendment and other constitutional clauses, and they won their case. And there were many efforts by Indians to do that, and they, I think, helped to transform American ways of thinking about liberty and freedom into much broader and deeper uh, ideas. Our guest is David Hackett Fisher. We have about 20 minutes left. We go to Boston next. Hi. Um, when the leading uh, Freemason, George Washington, a descendant of Ramses, Pizzo, and Bush, became the uh, first president of the United States, he appointed a brotherhood yes man called Ale Alexander Hamilton as the Secretary of the <coughs> Treasury. Hamilton introduced the Bank of the United States, a privately owned central bank, uh, which began to lend money to the U.S. government, so creating control by debt and interest debt from the very start. The Bank of the United States caused as much uh, poverty, bankruptcy, and rebellion, and uh, it was eventually closed down. But soon after um, came its replacement, the Federal, Re Federal Reserve, under the Emergency War Powers Act of 1933. These issues are not addressed um, in our historical context. When you consider that there were only five countries in the world in our current recent history that didn't have a centralized bank, Afghanistan now has a centralized bank after the war 
with Afghanistan. Um, the World Bank, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund really run the world. And our history is not, you cannot have a centralized uh, history, as you're, as you're stating, without including all history. And these issues are not addressed in your books. Thank, also, thank you, Boston. Yes, thanks for that, that question. I think you and I disagree on a number of things there, starting with Alexander Hamilton, who was nobody's Yes, man. But then also to the question of banks and, and politics. I don't write about these um, subjects in my book. Uh, I, I haven't really gotten to that part of uh, my books. I haven't gotten to that part of American history yet in, 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 the, in the books that I've published. But when I do, I'm going to tell a very different story from the story you've just told. It would be about a banking system that's an artifact of an open society. The uh, Federal Reserve System was not created in 1933. It was created early in the, in, the, in the 20th century, and it was a deliberately decentralized system. Um, we uh, made a point of that for a very long period of time, and that concern, which was very strong, the, the, the Federal Reserve System was partly designed under the, in the administration of Taft and then enacted by Woodrow Wilson, that system was designed by both Republicans and Democrats to create a more open banking system, which we have always had. Uh, and I don't think it's nearly as conglomerated or consolidated as, 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 as you tend, tend, tend to, to, to think. I have three email what-if questions. I don't know if you can take them, any of them. What do you think would, happen, would have happened if uh, George Washington had been killed in the French and Indian War? I, I find it, uh, those uh, what-if questions to be uh, uh, in, 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 incomprehensible in some sense. It's very difficult to get one's hands ar around it. I would w want to say that uh, Washington was as nearly an indispensable man as I can, I, I can imagine, uh, partly for his skill in inventing that new style of leadership that I spoke of and uh, have written about in, in Washington's uh, Crossing, partly for his respect for the values of, 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 the, of the revolution and, and the republic. I think that was the main thing. We were very lucky to have George Washington. And another one wants to know what it would have been, what it would have been like if uh, George Washington had come from a northern state. I, 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 George Washington just couldn't possibly have come from a northern state. The northern neck of Virginia was what, was what he was made of. He came from that clay. and. Um, I, 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 uh, uh, there are, uh, 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 that's a counterfactual <laughs> beyond the, beyond the, the power of my, uh, 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 of, of my thought. There I, is one question or an emailer who, who emailed that they were just, you know, everything that you read about George Washington is so positive. She wanted to know what the negative was. What the negatives were. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what? Uh, well, there is a book just out by Joseph Ellis. Uh, on uh, it's a, 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 a it's a, a, an essay on the it's a psychobiography mm -hmm. of George Washington and it does uh, stress uh, some of the the things that troubled the, the, he, Washington himself. He uh, had great difficulty managing his temper. He uh, and much of his career was a struggle for control over his very strong feelings and. Uh, 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 Joe Ellis has gone into that in in in, in some. To tell. It's a very interesting uh, book. I don't agree with it in some ways, but it's uh, very thoughtful on, 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 this, on this question. Well, since it's swinging around in the top of the New York Times bestseller list periodically, maybe, maybe what one thing do you, not dis do you disagree with him on? Well, I think he may have um, accentuated the negative a little too much. I, uh, I, I also tend to think that he understated the ideals of Washington. Uh, he makes Washington in a real, to a realist, which I believe he was, but his writings are filled with, uh, with high statements of ideals about what he called the, the, the cause. Tucson, Arizona. Yes, good night. I, I'd like to, uh, I'll, I'll ask my question to the gentleman and then I'll hang up and listen to you over the TV. Um, one of our local editorialists uh, in hindsight, looking at the, at the recent election, said that part of the reason that America is so divisive is because of our ethnic diversity. We are essentially a culturalist country, that we have borrowed most of our culture from elsewhere, and we have nothing to unite us that is exclusively American. I'd like to get your response on that. Uh, but I think exclusive, not exclusively, but um, especially American, 
is the way that we think about an open society and diversity itself. Uh, I, I tend to think that the more diverse we have come, uh, become, the stronger our system grows. This was the uh, this was an insight that, uh, 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 that James Madison had in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51, in which he argued that the republic would be stronger as it grew larger, and the number of what he called factions uh, grew uh, uh, greater uh, and, and more mixed. And I think that's exactly uh, what has happened here. As we get more and more groups, it makes it, as, Mar as Madison argued, more difficult for any small one group to tyrannize the others. And that keeps us open and free. Richmond, hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Fisher. Uh, yeah. It's a pleasure to speak with you, and I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon. I, I am very much. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite stories in uh, American history is that of Jefferson and Adams, uh, their partnership, their estrangement, and especially their reconciliation. Um, who are some other figures, uh, in your view, in American history that have, I guess, traveled a similar journey? They've fallen out and then eventually reconciled and explained uh, differing viewpoints of what direction America should go into each other. And as a second question, uh, it seems like there's a glut of uh, historical fiction in uh, pop culture these days. I uh, actually kind of uh, enjoy the, the trend. There's a lot of uh, historically based movies. Um, what are you, your views on this? Um, well, as to... Um as to, uh, as to your, the first part of your, your question, I, I, I think Jefferson and Adams are hard to top in, in that department of separation, estrangement, and, and, and reconciliation. There were others. One, was, uh, one pair would be, um, would be uh, Washington and Hamilton. I think not quite on the same level of intensity uh, as, uh, as Adams and, and Jefferson, but they were close in the revolution came apart at the end of the revolution, had a quarrel, fell apart, and then, uh, and, and, and then came together uh, again. There are other estrangements, uh, um, uh, other th th processes that work a little differently, but it have been very interesting to me. One of them is the relationship between uh, uh, two people who were not contemporary. It was uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan began as, uh, as a, a person who was a very, um, uh, who was a, a liberal New Dealer? Uh, then he moved uh, to the right, uh, but as he as he did that, he also uh, had a kind of reconciliation with with the, the large purposes of Franklin Roosevelt. Spoke very highly of of Roosevelt, much more highly than most people on the right uh, did uh, to that time. And, and I I have high hopes for that process of reconciliation and. I hope it will continue uh, with other uh, conservatives and new dealers uh, in our own time. You mentioned in Liberty and Freedom that Ronald Reagan was probably the most maligned president as well as probably the most loved. Well, I think that's, that, that was true of, his, uh, of, of, of Ronald Reagan in his own time. I, uh, though I'm a little left of center, I have high respect for what Ronald Reagan did in reviving a sense of confidence in American institutions uh, in the... 1980s. I, I think that was that's a major break in the history that I'm writing, and in other histories that are written from the left, uh, as well as mine from the center. And the caller's uh, question or comment about historical fiction, historical movies, their impact. Yes. And another uh, actual emailer had asked about your thoughts on the History Channel, how that how that works into our, our understanding. Delighted to see all these things happening with the the uh, the the uh, these are. Uh, the, the movie theaters are classrooms with a uh, much longer reach uh, than, uh, than I can hope for in, 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 uh, in, a, in a university. And it's the same with the History Channel, which has had a huge success. We now have two History Channels on our, uh, on our, our, our cable. And uh, I, I think uh, we, we're seeing um, in so many of these signs, uh, I think a kind of thought revolution that began to happen, I believe it was in the 1990s, as people began to discover history. I observe it in the universities where many disciplines began to introduce historical methods in their own disciplines. Uh, uh, it's a long list, I won't recite it, but, but uh, I, have a, I, I think it might have been, perhaps it was the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was the sense that history was happening to us. But people are getting a lot more interested, and it's in the m movies, it's 
on television. And do you get at all so, concerned that as the as the issues of the of the past or the the stories of the past come come to the to people today through these mediums uh, that there's a problem that the specifics of those stories, which are many times incorrect, are are getting yes, um, into the system. Yes, often the, the, the historical record is radically transformed in these mm -hmm. films, though the hist the, I believe the filmmakers are getting more careful about that in, in, in various ways. I think they have to. They, their public is getting more aware, and uh, they're held to, held to higher standards, as historians are uh, too. And I, what they do is generate interest and draw people to, to, other, to, other, to books, to to inquiries, and I think that's that's all to the good, even when the facts are not quite what they should be. And uh, just in a final question on this, in the whole discussion of holding historians to a standard, the com the uh, controversies over the past years of Joseph Ellis, of yes. Doris Kearns Goodwin, of uh, the deceased Stephen Ambrose, is that America holding them to a higher standard? I think or? that's exactly what's happening. I think they're, uh, that, that our writings are being more scrutinized, uh, uh, scrutinized more closely than they were uh, before. I think, the, in general, the level of practice has been, has been rising, uh, uh, both in scholarly monographs and, uh, and also books that are written for, for a large, uh, for a large uh, public. There are two books out on this, so uh, one of them really accentuates the negative here. Another by Ron Robin um, takes the view that I've just described and, 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 and develops it at some length. Historians get things wrong all the time. Everybody who writes history gets things wrong, and it's possible to do that in, in, in so many ways in a, in a book. But, uh, but I, think, um, I think the standards are, are, are rising. And Norton, Virginia. Good afternoon. Hi. It's an honor to speak with Dr. Fisher. I live in the purple corner of Virginia, so I have been advocating a debate about the repeal of the 17th Amendment as a means of insulating the Senate from both religious passions and mercantile interests and the judiciary. So I wonder if Dr. Fisher would share what he knows about the period in 1913 when we passed this. and make whatever contribution he can to this debate. Well, I'm in favor of more, de I think the remedy for the, all the, the ills of democracy, of which there are many, is more democracy. And so I wouldn't want to take that step back. I'd want to take a step forward. I'd want to in increase um, the, 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 the linkages uh, between uh, uh, representatives and their constituents. And I think we're seeing that happening in some of the technological revolutions that we've been living through lately. Boulder, Colorado. Hello, Boulder. I uh, don't know whether you're familiar with Einstein's comment that we'll never have peace as long as each country gets to write its own history. And then uh, the uh, fact that history is usually written by the victors. So my question is, uh, when Bush came in to his presidency, his first term, they were supposed to release the prior pre presidential records for his father, and he sat on that. And I'm concerned about how history can be written if records get destroyed or modified, as certain records up on the Internet from EPA or NOAA or other organizations have been modified for certain reasons that they weren't written that way by the scientists, but they've been changed for political reasons. So I'll hang up. Thanks, Carla. Yes, well, uh, much, uh, much material has been destroyed that historians would love to, to be able to get their hands on, but also more materials coming out all the time. And I, m many countries now have Freedom of Information Acts, are making materials uh, more accessible than they've been before, and I think in terms of a process, we are seeing more opening uh, rather than more, uh, more in the way of, of, of closing. Richmond, Virginia. Hello. You're on the air, sir. Uh, Dr. Fisher, you've uh, talked about so many fascinating things, it's hard to know where to start. But there are two things that I'd like to talk to you about, one completely unrelated, one 
has to do with the separation of church and state, and the other has to do with Jewett's ride in comparison with Paul Revere's ride. Um, with respect to the first, you, you raised this issue earlier in your talk, and um, I wonder how the idea of uh, separation of church and state got into our Constitution in the first place, and um, is it uh, are, are we really in an era where that's, uh, those distinctions are being eroded, or is that uh, just a perspective, a modern perspective that has no historical basis? In other words, have we ignored this principle in the past? Um, and uh, I also wonder whether you are concerned about the erosion of the separation between church and state. So I um, was a child when you were, and at that time I think it was okay to uh, believe that um, uh, if you didn't believe the way I did, you were going to hell uh, when all of the heathens lived on the other side of the world. But now these heathens are our neighbors, and I can think of nothing more polarizing than um, uh, views of uh, organized uh, religion. Um, Thanks, caller. As to, uh, as, as, as to separation of church and state, I, I think there were two paths, the first part of your question, two paths to... To, 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 the, to that idea of, of separation of church and state. One of them came from uh, men such as Roger Williams, uh, who was interested in keeping the state and the church apart, mainly to protect the church, to protect religion uh, from the corruption of, of power. Then others, uh, uh, others would be Thomas Jefferson and, and James Madison, who were more interested in separating church and state to protect the state. Uh, from the tyranny of, of religious uh, groups. And I think both of those ideas were very strong in early America, strong in, in the period when the Constitution was enacted, and explains why we uh, have uh, the wording in the First Amendment uh, uh, as it is. As to the second part of that question about the trends uh, through uh, in, in our own uh, time, yes, I, I share your concern. I do think that uh, evangelical Christians, uh, whom I know, I was uh, re not very long ago uh, invited uh, to meet with um, at, at a gathering of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention in, in Puerto Rico of l leaders from all over the country in what is uh, one of the largest of our evangelical groups. And they were divided on the subject of church and state, but many of them believed deeply in the separation of church and state. The idea that evangelical Christians as, in general or trying to erode um, the, 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 that separation, I think is not correct of the, uh, uh, as, a, as, as a generalization. There are, there are a, 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 some on both sides of the question, as there have been throughout, uh, throughout uh, uh, American history. But I don't think we're, we're losing that principle. It's just fiercely contested today. Shelby, That's Ohio. It. Hello, Dr. Fisher. Um, two questions. Uh, in Albion Seed, uh, in the introduction, you seem to indicate that there will be more written along this theme of folkways. Um, I'm particularly interested in that question and how, how varying folkways play out uh, in 21st century American life. Uh, and I'm wondering if there is going to be more from your pen uh, regarding that theme. The second is about some of your earlier books, uh, The Great Wave and your book on aging. Uh, the Great Wave, uh, quite often you arrive at conclusions that um, they, they seem kind of nebulous, kind of like, um, you know, it should be obvious to anybody what we should do with this information. And I'm wondering if since you've written that book, you've had any thoughts about spelling out for some of us for whom the conclusions are not so obvious what some of these uh, economic theories, uh, how they should play out in our uh, modern uh, life. Um, I, a question, I'm sorry, I, f I missed the first part of your question, which was um, Which was about, about Albion, Albion Seed. Yeah. Yes, about Albion Seed. The, uh, there is another volume that's just, just appeared, The Liberty and Freedom, continues some of, the, um, some of these ideas uh, uh, even into the 21st century. You might you, you find a little bit more uh, there on, on, on that part. As to the, 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 the second part of your question about the Great Wave, I think the conclusions, I, my thoughts are still pretty much the same as they were when I, I, I wrote the, 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 the book. It was there were conclusions about, about the writing of history in, 
economics, um, which were an attempt to, to uh, an argument for linking economic theory to historical problems. I, I think that's still roughly right. I think I would be doing a little bit more with arguments for um, a, a regulation that I uh, uh, took up very briefly, too briefly, in the book. But otherwise, I, I, my thoughts are still about the same. One more call, Orange County, California. Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Uh, I am going to invoke the Lars and Penates of the house of Walker Evans and uh, Ernest Agee and paraphrase Pearl Buck. Uh, the measure of any society is the manner in which it treats the least of theirs, and I haven't heard anyone addressing the problems of the mass of the workers of the world, the people who uh, really have formed uh, this country, the people who will fight and die, and the ones who are least remembered. Thanks, California. Thank you for that, for, for, for your question. I, uh, much of American history today is written around uh, that problem, I, uh, I, and it uh, centers on, uh, on, on the history of poverty in America, on the history of racial uh, exploitation. I think my, many of my colleagues are, are, real, are, are, are deep into those, uh, those issues, and uh, there are two themes that emerge from their work. The one is about um, the ways in which I think the system has become at least a little more um, uh, open and, uh, and, and, and fair. Uh, the other is about uh, how it could become more open and, and more fair. And, uh, uh, and, and, and there's a very large literature. I'd especially recommend the work of my, of my colleague Jacqueline Jones, who's written at length on those, uh, on, on those issues. I want to conclude with just this email, which may <clears throat> sum up some people's uh, confusion or um, their, uh, their problems with, with reading history today when they just want to be out there learning. This uh, gentleman, Howard McPherson, says, when I read two different history books on the same subject, both versions sound reasonable to me, and they're often widely divergent. How are non-historians to, to learn how to evaluate these writings? Any suggestions? I, I think there are two ways. Uh, one is to take of the, 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 of the point, the center on the point of friction between, between two works, uh, and then um, uh, read a third book. Or uh, read, uh, find a primary source. A lot of them are available, lots of primary materials on the web, and you can become your own historian that way. Uh, uh, the web has, has given, given all of us a, a longer uh, a reach. It's that principle of inquiry, I think, that's the answer to that uh, problem. Just uh, keep the inquiry going. If you go to our website, uh, you will find there a list of all of the books that David Hackett Fisher, our guest on In Depth this month, has written, as well as a biography of him, as well as some of the things that most have most influenced him, and the books that he's reading right now, and the books that he's liked the most. This is his newest book, Liberty and Freedom, A Visual History of America's Founding Ideas. Thank you for spending three hours with us. Well, miles to, to get some assistance to get out again. And in the process, we were talking about contingency, even as we were living it in our own, uh, in, in, in that moment. I want to uh, ask you about the, uh, the introduction of your newest book, <clears throat> Liberty and Freedom. And I, found, I came across one sentence that I thought was interesting, and, and you asked you to explain it. You say this, that in the study of history, every answer becomes another question. Yes, I, I'm very much conscious of history as a, as inquiry. You asked me for the books that are most important to me, and mm -hmm. first on the list was Herodotus. Herodotus called his book The Histories, and that meant inquiries, the inquiries of Herodotus. Uh, and uh, I, I've always been, uh, been, been following that. And then I tried to write my books in, in this storytelling mode around a series of, uh, uh, of discoveries that I've made and the reader is invited to become a, become a part of. We have your complete list that we can show our viewers now. These, again, are some of your favorite mm -hmm. history books, and uh, I couldn't help but notice the Alexis de Tocqueville one, Three Yes. Down. Why is de Tocqueville Well, he's the other, another part of this, that uh, contingencies come down to events, but then I'm also interested in webs and structures of choice, and that's what Tocqueville was so good at in, in his... Uh, in his uh, an extraordinary thoughtful book on, on how on how America works a, as a web of, of choices that, that
that, that uh, people make. Well, David Hackett Fisher has been writing history for many years, and we've asked him to be our guest for this month on In Depth. We're going to invite you to join us, and we'll start taking your calls in 10 minutes. Here's the numbers you can call if you'd like to join us, 202-628-0205, if you live in the East or Central Time Zone, 202-737-0002, if you live in the Mountain or Pacific time zone. We'll also be taking your emails today. And the email address is uh, booktv at cspan.org. Now, because uh, this is being recorded uh, and shown for the first time uh, in the weekend after the election of 2004, I wanted to ask you this, which is an email that came in from a student from Bishop Kelly High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have a group of students out there who, who watch us, this program religiously and send us in their questions. They say, in the election of 2000 and this past election, many people believe that the Electoral College should be voided or dismantled. Would you agree with the statement that since it was built by our founding fathers, it would be unpatriotic to get rid of the Electoral College, or would you say that it's not applicable to modern America? I think we could do without the Electoral College, but I think we're going to have to live with it for as far into the future as I can see. It's very important to small states, and they would have to vote on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a change. Since we've so, heard so much uh, about it, can you tell us the story of it? Well, the Electoral College actually was, I think, the first Electoral College, or something like an electoral system was worked out in the Constitution of the State of Maryland in 1776. And there, it was a similar problem. It was a, a bringing together very different parts of a very complex state. Uh, and uh, the electoral system there was designed uh, to do the same sort of thing. I, the, I think the purpose of the Electoral College was, was primarily a, a, a federal purpose. It was uh, meant to represent states as well as uh, individual voters. And that was more important at the outset of American history than it is today. But it was urgently important, I think, for the founders to get that federal system working at the start. Now, we've, or, pay, excuse me, we've paid so much attention to it in the last uh, four years or so. But going back in, in history, were there earlier times in which uh, it has been in the news like, like it is it's, today? It's failed uh, uh, several times, three times in particular. Once was in the election of 18. Hundred uh, when a tie uh, uh, developed uh, between uh, Jefferson and Burr, and, and the election had to go into the House of Representatives. It was a very protracted crisis, even to the point where it was said that that uh, uh, troops were beginning to uh, muster, ready to uh, in, in some maybe even beginning to march on Washington at one step and we at one stage. And we came very close uh, to a to a major uh, crisis, even a even a collapse of the of the system. Then and uh, survived just by the narrowest uh, margin. It was difficult again in 1824 and once more in 1876. And uh, I think uh, it, it has gotten us into considerable trouble. But I, I, uh, sadly, I don't think we're going to be able to, to change it. Uh, because of uh, politics? Be because of the, of the interest that small states have in, in, in preserving it. Is that good for democracy or No, bad? It's, it's not good. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, 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 even a corruption, I think, in, in, the, in the system. How? Uh, in that it, uh, we're suppo I think we, we, are, uh, we, we should be representing the, 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 the people uh, now. That's so we've become a democracy, which we weren't in, in 1787 uh, uh, when, when this was uh, designed. Now, I will tell you that I have listened to many, many viewers over the many years that I've been here, and I know somebody's getting on the phone right now to say it's not a democracy, it's a republic. Yes. <laughs> it was a republic, and still is, but I, I, I believe that the, the so-called price revolution of the of the 16th century. So they, they, they're very different, one, for, one from another. David Hackett Fisher is our guest. San Francisco, you're next. Hello. San Francisco, please speak up and go ahead. Hello. Hello, yep. Dr. Fisher. Yes. Yes, I want to thank you for being on the show this afternoon. Um, I have a question in regards to your book, uh, Albion Seed, which I've greatly enjoyed. And with our recent presidential election, uh, could you comment on maybe some of the makeup that would have been in both um, Central Heritage and uh, also President Bush's heritage and how that relates to uh, some of the things that uh, President Bush may be doing uh, for the next four years. I think both, uh, it's interesting that both uh, Mr. Kerry and, and, and Mr. Bush have very strong Yankee roots, um, but, um, uh, but Mr. Bush was uh, moved to Texas at an impressionable age. 
And I think in cultural ways, he's much more a product of what I call the back country. Uh, I, I, I know um, nothing pejorative was meant by that phrase. It was the way it was called in the 18th century. It's the world uh, uh, that stresses an idea of, of liberty as independence, uh, as personal responsibility. And uh, John Kerry's uh, 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 culture is more continuously New England. And that's a, that's a, a, a culture in which uh, people had a more a collective sense of responsibility. Uh, they, 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 they were town-born uh, people. And uh, they spoke in the revolution, uh, Samuel Adams, of the, of the liberty of New England, uh, the liberty of, 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 of America as a sense of collective rights. And I think we can see that difference in the way that Mr. Bush and Mr. Kerry think about the, the world. We can also see it in the electoral maps. And one thing that I observe in, in, in the maps of 2004 is a very, very strong regional pattern. Uh, New England is a, is, is a, is a solid block uh, of, of blue. And, uh, and the, uh, the Southern Highlands, uh, much of the West, is a, is a sea of red. Uh, and those, that's, a, that's a cultural pattern, uh, as well as a geographical one. Uh, for people who do, are not familiar with this book, it was, I think it was published in 89? That, that's correct. And it, what it, is it about in general? It's mainly about the origins of, of regional cultures in, in, in early, early America. I was curious to know uh, why New Englanders uh, talk with a Yankee twang. And people in the South have a different way of, of talking. And uh, there's, there are a set of Western a speech ways and a, a Midland accent. And I found that in other patterns, the way we build our houses, the way we do the ordinary things in life, uh, tying in with four great migrations that happened in America from 1630 to 1775. It's about those four migrations coming from different parts of England, different religious groups, different periods of British history, uh, and creating hegemonic regional cultures that uh, that persist even to this day. Uh, throughout our program today, we're going to be going through a lot of uh, different books that uh, uh, David Hackett Fisher has written. And if you just would like a list of all of them, you can go to our website. It's www.booktv.org, and you can take a list at, uh, look at all of the books that we're discussing today, as well as see some of the lists that you're mm -hmm. going to see of uh, books that have been influential to you, books that you're reading now, that type of thing. Next is Salisbury, Maryland. Hello. Hello. You're on the air. Thank you kindly, and thank you, C-SPAN. Uh, Dr. Fisher. Yes. Uh, it's just been brought to light that there was uh, thousands of uh, Negro soldiers during the Revolutionary War. Yes. And they fought on both sides because they were uh, promised their freedom. Now, I, uh, my question is, after the uh, war and the uh, things had ceased, were these uh, slaves given their freedom? How were they treated? And what effect did it have on the uh, formulation or the Declaration of Independence. I think you're absolutely right about, about African Americans in the Revolution, many of them uh, joining very actively on both sides, just as you say. And there was a pattern to that. I th uh, the uh, the uh, uh, former slaves, nearly all of them were, were, were former slaves, that is 90 percent, more than 90 percent, uh, were, uh, were in slavery in 1775. But the, those who had been slaves in the northern colonies, by and large, believed, this was certainly the case in New England, that they would win their freedom as a consequence of the revolution. And so they did. Uh, and they uh, took up arms um, on, the si on, on the side of the, of, of, of the, of the of American Whigs. In the South, um, many slaves uh, thought that there was no hope of, of freedom in the revolution, uh, where their slave owners uh, were uh, with, with, were, were leading the, the Whig movement. And so many uh, supported the British side, once again in hope of, of their freedom. And uh, different things happened to them. Uh, many uh, were given freedom. Uh, there is a, a, a community of former Southern slaves in Nova Scotia today, others in Canada, uh, some in the Bahamas. But, uh, but uh, others were sold into slave events of, the, uh, uh, of, our, of our history, have turned it into a democracy. Uh, uh, and it's a very healthy one today. Where did you get your inspiration to become 
first a professor, or was it first a professor then a writer, or first a writer then it a professor? It was uh, first uh, first uh, a, a teacher, a mm -hmm. historian, and then a, then then a writer. Two things together. I, it grew out of my uh, origins in in Maryland. I I uh, I, I had uh, I'm a, a typical American mongrel and of the most common variety. Um, and very strong claims were made m on my identity, all in historical terms. The, these were the Baltimore Burger Germans, H.L. Mencken, that world, strong sense of itself. And then on my mother's side, uh, roots to, to an older Maryland, and to Pennsylvania, the Quakers, to the, to the, to the Scots-Irish in the back country. And um, all of those uh, claims put a problem to me in historical terms. And then I had lots of members of my family who were great storytellers. And I remember an aunt um, who told a story about her, uh, uh, when she was a young girl uh, in the mid-19th century, and she spoke of a, of a day uh, when she heard a sound outside of her farm door north of Baltimore. It sounded like the wind in the trees. And she went outside. There was no wind. But she looked up the road, and she saw, as far as you could see, a long line of wagons with the wounded from Gettysburg. And that sound like the wind was the sound of those men. And that was told to us when we were very young. And that was the broth in which I was cooked. Uh, that's, that's a recipe for making a historian. Is this your mother? That's my mother. That would have take, been taken about 1938. Uh, she was uh, an English and a history major in the School of General Studies at Johns Hopkins. That's my brother Miles. Which one now is a you? Lawyer. I'm the older one, You're this in, the, one. in the back. Uh -huh. I think I would have been about two or three years old. Uh, there are three, I think, and my brother about, about one. And um, uh, my mother had a deep interest in history as well. And uh, my father had a great impact on me in a different way, and I think changed the sort of history I write. He, uh, in the Depression, got a job as a school teacher in, in Maryland, and uh, then rose uh, very quickly to be superintendent of the Baltimore school system. And uh, then, a after I uh, uh, finished in school, went on uh, to become a president of Teachers College, Columbia University. And uh, in my uh, youth, I'd hear stories around the dining room table about, yes, the way uh, history was happening in, in the town where, where we lived. And it was a story of people making choices. And that's, uh, I think that's where I got my, my interest in, in that. Are, are either of your parents living? My father is, is uh, living. My mother passed away two years ago. And my father is still my most trusted uh, advisor. Uh, he um, uh, uh, reads my uh, uh, books and is a, a very uh, keen critic. He read the uh, conclusion to Liberty and Freedom. And uh, I said, what do you think? He said, cut it. I had cut it considerably. <laughs> and I took it back. And I said, what do you think now? He said, cut it again. And uh, he 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 is a uh, uh, he he gives me very very straight uh, advice. What was his uh, expertise? What he he was uh, in he was a school in, in he was an educational administrator was what he was primarily, uh, and um, he was also the head of the Baltimore school system in 1954 when Brown versus Board of Education came down. This is uh, and, pro probably uh, a more, more recent picture of him. Yes, uh, that's just a, that's only a few months ago. Uh, with uh, I think that's with my wife uh, Judy and our, our a a new, grand, a new grandson Matthew, who lives here. He lives in, 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 in the Washington area in Chevy Chase. Is this Matthew that's reading Matthew Grandpa's again. book? Uh, no, he's uh, reading. I believe his uh, father's work. He, his father is uh, in uh, 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 cognitive science and. Uh, and uh, uh, that that area. Go back to what you were saying about your fa your father and Brown versus Board. Yes, I, well, I, I felt as if I was a, a, a witness to that chapter of, of American history. Why? Uh, in that uh, he had uh, tales to tell. We saw that un, 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 uh, developing in Baltimore when uh, it came down very suddenly, and uh, people were wondering quite what to do. And my father and a and a mayor, uh, the mayor of Baltimore, his name was Thomas D'Alessandro. Uh, worked together. D'Alessandro had a very effective democratic machine, and yet he believed that good schools are good politics. And so they worked to move very quickly, and uh, there were more choices again. I, I've had occasion to talk about that 
with Thomas Dallas Andrews' daughter, who's Nancy Pelosi. And we, uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, similar memories of, 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 our, of, of our, our, our fathers in, in moments like that. You uh, teach now at Brandeis? I do, yes. What's it like to teach at Brandeis? It's a wonderful place. My, my, again, my father says that some students learn no matter what you do to them. And I think that uh, Brandeis, is, Brandeis students are very much, very much like that. How long have you been teaching there? I've been there since 1962, uh, off and on it. David Hackett Fisher, how do you feel when reviewers or readers say to you, I love your books, they read just like fiction? Well, I take that as a compliment. Uh, I, my, one of my books was on the bedside table of a lady who was interviewed by, by Vanity Fair, and uh, she said, I love to read historical novels. This was uh, Washington's, Washington Crossing the Delaware. And that's not a historical no, novel. No, but... Uh, How do you I, feel about historical novels? I think they're a great model for us when it comes to storytelling. And uh, I, we, we're not trained to that. And... Uh, and we can learn from, what, from how they do it. We meaning historians? Historians, professional historians, yes. When did you first start writing in the narrative form? Or I think you call it braided? A braided narrative. narrative. I, is that? I, I came to that um, it, it, by degrees, but mainly I started with the, the book on Paul Revere. And uh, I'd had a sense that before then, we'd been through two stages of the old political history and the new social history. And uh, both had done some things very well and others badly, and I wanted to combine their strengths. So that led me to try to tell a story in a braided narrative, and Paul Revere was the result. And braided means? It means uh, different things going on. It means it's a story about people making choices and choices making a difference in the world. And so I worked with first uh, braiding the story of the choices that Paul Revere was making against General Gage on the British side. And then in, in Mrs. Gage and Mrs. Revere and uh, uh, many people if, throughout the, the, the area that, that Paul Revere lived in. You, is this what you call contingency? By, by contingency, I mean choices. Uh, other people have different ideas. Uh, when uh, Stephen Jay Gould was telling the story of the Burgess Shale fossils and trying to rework the history of evolution, he introduced what he called contingency to mean accidents. And then uh, my colleague James McPherson uh, uh, did his book on the Civil War around contingency, and he meant turning points. And I have another way of thinking about and it. And what is uh, yours? It's people making choices that way. And it's a way of getting beyond the heavy determinism we had uh, 10, 20 years ago. Can you give an example of it? Of contingency? Mm -hmm. It would be uh, uh, the, the people in, on, the, on the American side uh, thinking about how the war would start. They were quite sure in the spring of 1775 that they'd come to that point. And they wanted to make very sure that it would start in ways that joined people to their cause. And so among the messages Paul Revere was carrying was one that instructed the, the Minutemen uh, to, uh, in, in the towns to come out uh, when the regulars appeared as they were expected to and to stand by the road and constitute an army of observation, but not to fire the first shot. It was a choice that Samuel Adams made. He said, put your enemy in the wrong and keep him there. It's the best way in politics as well as war. And so they went into the, into the war uh, making sure that the first shot was fired by the other side. A decision, so, and uh, therefore... It was a choice, mm -hmm. and a good many of our leaders have done that uh, in World War II, World War I. Uh, the Fort Sumter crisis for the North. Other leaders have not done that and have gone in with a divided country. And uh, then we get into trouble. And now you've also written about more recent times, especially in your, your newest book. Yes. Would you say uh, in recent years presidents have used this? I think every president makes choices and we've seen some who've been very conscious of the same sorts of uh, concerns that, that Samuel Adams had. Uh, others were thinking more of different things. So. Now, um, in the acknowledgments for your Paul Revere book, I couldn't mm -hmm. help but notice a story you tell, but since you bring up James McPherson, and here's a picture of the two of you. Where's yes. this taken? This was in his kitchen uh, in Princeton, and uh, I was down to give, a, give a, 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 a talk on Washington's Crossing. That's a bottle of champagne, two editors hard at work there, and, which was sent to us by our editor at the Oxford Press. Uh, he and I are friends for uh, 40 years. We went to graduate school together at Johns Hopkins. 
Uh, and then uh, we uh, decided to try to do a series of books around the theme of contingency. And it's called Pivotal Moments in American History. Uh, Jim did a book on Antietam. Uh, my book was Washington's Crossing. Uh, the logo for the series is the lantern in the Old North Church. And we've, our sixth book has just come out. It's John Farrelling on the election of 1800. Uh, and uh, I think we've got about 25 uh, 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 in progress at the, at the moment. Uh, uh, James McPherson has sat in this chair for three hours during our, ser uh, during our series also, so I'm sure our viewers are, are very familiar with his books also. Uh, when, you, when, you were write, when you wrote in your acknowledgments, however, you told a story about you and James McPherson going out to a Civil War battlefield and yes. how contingency played into your life there. We were uh, both, uh, we, were, we were doing a, a Princeton Alumni College uh, and we wanted to scout out some of the sites. We had a wonderful time on the Delta Queen steamboat and we uh, followed the Western campaigns of the Civil War and got a little too close uh, to, to Fort Henry uh, and deep in the mud, had to uh, other places, but that's been my... My, my base. Mm -hmm. I think we have some video of it. Uh, ha how, many a, how many classes do you teach? I teach mainly a one, I teach one course in one semester and two courses another. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it has about 2,800 undergraduates, about a thousand graduate students. Uh, small classes, uh, uh, the close teaching. I try to work uh, with a combination of an American lecture course and uh, an American version of an Oxford tutorial, which I've done some teaching in. But the tutorial's not centered on exams, but centered on writing papers, uh, doing independent research. Uh, this is your office and, uh, there? That's, that's where I meet with my, with my students. Do you write there too? No, I write at home in a converted garage filled to overflowing with books. Uh, my wife says her next husband will have to be illiterate. And uh, the, the, the house is just uh, choked with, uh, with, uh, the, 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 with, with books. Uh. Well, let's just some, grab some calls for you, and then we'll get back and show some people <clears throat> some of your older work that they may not have, have seen before. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank C-SPAN. Uh, you guys provide the most interesting and informative programming on television. Thank you very much. Dr. Fisher, uh, I, hope I, I hope you talk about your book, The Great Wave, in, in this program. However, my question is about the American Revolution. Specifically, is there any way to evaluate the accuracy of Adams' observation that the American people were divided into one-third patriots, one-third loyalists, and one-third indifferent uh, immediately before the American Revolution? There is, I think, an inaccuracy uh, there. Uh, the inaccuracy is that when John Adams said that about the American Revolution uh, in, a, uh, in a letter to a friend in Massachusetts, it turns out he was referring to the French Revolution. And many historians misread that and repeated it as a judgment on the American Revolution instead. Uh, in another letter I found in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania uh, to, uh, to James McKean, he tries to make the same estimate for the American Revolution, and there he says two-thirds for one-third against. And I think that's probably roughly right as an average, though it varied a lot from one part of the country to another. The Great Wave. Uh, the, the, the Great Wave uh, was a very different sort of project. I've had a, a secret life as a price historian. I've never had an economics course, but I had a great teacher at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it was um, uh, uh, Frederick Lane, his name was. He was uh, an old-fashioned economic historian working mainly on the history of medieval Venice. And I met a, a rigor that I'd never n known before. And many of the great European historians would come to Baltimore to visit with Fred. And uh, he'd invite us uh, as well. And uh, I had the sense of being a, a, a partner in a, in, a, in a shared enterprise and started collecting materials on prices. I was mainly interested not in prices, but in change, how things change. And I found that price records are the, give us the longest run of material on, on, on change that, uh, of, of any sort of documentation. We have price records that go back th about 4,000 years. Uh, and um, uh, we have good price series for about 1,000 years. And so I put that together and looked for the rhythm of change in, in price history. And Found a series of waves in, in not cycles, nothing mm -hmm. like a Kondratiev pattern, 
These are not predictable uh, any more than waves in the sea, uh, but they have a very strong impact, I think, on the world where, in which we live. Can you give just an example of one of the waves? Yes. Uh, it's about four major waves of inflation, of which the last began in 1896, and we all know it very well. It reached a peak in the, in the 1970s, uh, uh, about 1980. Uh, and uh, th this was a wave of rising prices that was profoundly disruptive of, of uh, societies. I think it led partly, it was a, it partly responsible for the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, put a heavy strain on our system. And um, uh, then uh, the, the wave was driven mainly, I think, by aggregate demand, by population surging in that period. And then it broke I around 1980. And I, 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 we have another period of disinflation, then deflation, then stability, and that's what we've been in now. Uh, not um, perfect equilibrium, lots of fluctuations, mm -hmm. the oil prices that we've seen mm -hmm. recently, but no long-term price inflation. And uh, the world behaves very differently in, 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 those, in, in these periods. And you're saying that there's no way to, to uh, look forward in under this uh, scenario and know when the next wave is coming We can't predict the timing. Nobody's been able to do that. They're highly variable in, 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 in their timing. But they're very similar, these great waves, in their wave-like structure, uh, which means uh, a similar uh, impact on social relations, uh, similar uh, sequences of economic events. How about the length of the, the wave? The, they vary. Some were as short as 70 years. There's one in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Others as long as about 160 in the, in the 16th century.